Chapter One of Some Battle Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. Chapter One What It's Like in the Push there is nothing of the professional publicist about the average wounded soldier officer or man now landing day by day at southampton they are all more concerned thank goodness with action than speech with doing things and getting them done rather than with describing them it is not of course that these heroes of ours are either unwilling or unable to talk they are almost invariably and no matter what the nature of their wounds in the highest of good spirits delighted to pay a visit to blighty happy to have had the chance of playing the fine part they have played in the great allied offensive absolutely assured as to the victorious outcome of the push but they have no very accurate notions as to the relative values of the different disjointed staccato frequently vivid bits of information they have to dispense with matches or scraps of paper or a nicotine-stained forefinger made to serve as pencil in the nearest conveniently dusty surface they will give you elaborate expositions of the tactics they have helped to work out their little lectures on the strategy of the push are frequently couched in language more graphic racy and convincing than the most free and easy of generals ever permits himself to use and their lovable faces sometimes show a glimmer of disappointment for that one does not take copious notes regarding these demonstrations but on the other hand they deprecate with almost pitying wonder the notes one does jot down from time to time in talk with them when by accident they enrich one with some vivid stabbing little thrust of triumphant scene-painting likely to provide an answer to the constantly reiterated question as to what it's like in the push oh i say you know don't bother about that guff everybody knows about that of course but if you really want to know what the plan was in the blank blank show i can tell you in a minute so far as our brigade went you see zero was blank blank and we were on the right flank of the blank blank etc at the moment one has specially in mind a young company commander a captain of the blank blank almost the last wounded soldier to be landed from the hospital ship blank blank on a certain recent night he had a good deal of the descriptive gift and was perfectly unconscious of his occasional use of it one strained his indulgence a good deal and took many notes while talking with him what one sets down here are just the bits he regarded as guff convinced that every one knows about that of course his fluent strategy and tactics uh, but i promise they shall be preserved in the archives of his grateful country eh? oh just an ordinary front-line trench you know rather chipped about of course by the bosch heavies you know but blank blank oh hang it you know what the ordinary fire trench looks like along the north side of the mammoth's woods we were what oh oh yes we were packed pretty close of course while we were waiting only got there a little before midnight my chaps were all in splendid heart and keen as mustard to get the word go i was lucky met my friend g almost directly we got in he's had months in that bit of the line and knew every twist of it so was able to give me tips he took me along to his dugout after i got all my chaps in position and gave me some jolly good hot cafe au lait tell you a funny thing about that dugout after good dugout with a darned sight better overhead cover than most or it wouldn't have been there after the pounding the line had had in the week before g had a magnificent arrangement for cooking i forget the name of the stove but you pump it up like a bicycle tire and then it burns like the deuce gives you a hot drink before you can turn around i'm going to have one before i go back we had two good-sized kettles and after we'd finished our drink we ran a regular canteen for about half an hour 
boiling up cafe au lait as fast as the machine would turn it out and dishing it out all along the line of my fellows in their mess tins the weather was jolly just then but there'd been a lot of rain and the trench was in a beastly state you know what it's like after a lot of straffing when you get heavy rains on the churned-up ground it was like porridge with syrup over it and we were all absolutely plastered hair and moustaches and everything before we'd been half an hour in the place the boche was crumping us pretty heavy all the time but it didn't really matter because for some reason he hadn't seemed to have got our range just right and nearly all his big stuff was landing in front or behind and giving us very little but the mud of it what did worry me a bit was his machine guns his snipers too seemed fairly on the spot though how the devil they could be with our artillery as busy as it was i can't think but i know several of my sentries were laid out by rifle bullets i particularly wanted to let the others get a smoke when they could seeing we'd be there three or four hours helps to keep em steady in the waiting you know but we had to be mighty careful about matches the boches being no more than a hundred yards off i hate the feeling of that stinking porridgey clay caking on your hands and face don't you but one didn't notice it after a bit because it was the same all over but one had to watch out for rifles and ammunition and that you know pretty easy to get all the rifle barrels bunged up in the dark you know our adjutant came along about three checking up watches and giving us divisional time mine was all right never stopped once from the day i bought it till that left wrist of mine was hit see it registers my first hit eight twenty six i'll keep that souvenir but i'm afraid it's done as a timekeeper just before three i got my position right in the middle of my company we were going over at eight twenty five you know the trench was deep there with a hell of a lot of mud and water but there was no set parapet left just a gradual slope of muck as though cartloads of it had been dropped from the sky by giants spilt porridge i wanted to be first out if i could good effect on the men you know but i couldn't trust myself amid all that muck so i'd collared a rum case from blank's dugout and was nursing the blooming thing so that when the time came i could plant it in the mud and get a bit of a spring from that glad i did too i passed the word along at a quarter past to be ready for my whistle but it was all you could do to make a fellow hear by shouting in his ear our heavies were giving it lip then i can tell you i was in a devil of a stew lest some of my chaps should get over too soon they kept wriggling up and forward in the mud they were frightfully keen to get moving i gathered from my sergeant their one fear was that if we couldn't soon get going our artillery would have left no strafing for us to do little they knew their bosh if they thought that i thought i could just make out our artillery lift about a minute and a half before the twenty-five but i wouldn't swear to it on the stroke of the twenty-five i got a good jump from my rum box and fell head first into a little pool whiz bang hole i suppose something small it loosened two of my front teeth pretty much i'd my whistle in my teeth you see but i blew like blazes directly i got my head up never made a sound whistle full of mud but it didn't matter a bit they all saw me take my dive and a lot were in front of me when i got going but i overhauled em and got in front i believe we must have got nearly fifty yards without a casualty but it's hard to say it wasn't light you know just a glimmering kind of a greyness not easy to spot casualties the row of course was deafening and we were running like lamplighters you remember our practice stunts at home short rushes and taking cover in folds of the ground remember your file of direction sir dressin by the right and all that oh the boys remembered it right enough but good lord it wasn't much like salisbury plain we were going hell for leather you know you think you're going strong and whoosh you've put your face deep in porridge fallen in a shell hole you trip over some blamed thing and you turn a complete somersault and you're on again not quite sure which end of you is up 
spitting out mud wondering where your second wind is lord you haven't a notion whether you're hit or not i felt that smack on my left wrist along with a dozen other smacks of one sort or another but i didn't know it was a wound for an hour or more all you thought about was trying to keep your rifle muzzle up and i guess the fellows behind must have thought a bit about not sticking us with their bayonets more than they could help i was shouting blank the local name of the regiment you know the boys like it but my sergeant who was close to me was just yelling down em boys and stick em stick em for all he was worth my lot were bound for the second line you see my number twelve platoon with eighteen of d were to look after cleaning up the boche first line there was no real parapet left in that Bosch front line. Their trench was just a sort of gash, a ragged crack in the porridge. Where I was, there was quite a bit of their wire left. But do you know, one didn't feel it a bit. You can judge a bit from my rage what it was like. We went at it like fellows in a race charged the tape, and it didn't hurt us any more. Only thing that worried us was the porridge and the holes your feet sinking down make you feel you're crawling making no headway i wish i could have seen a bit better it was all a muddy blur to me but i made out a line of faces in the boche ditch and i know i gave a devil of a yell as we jumped for those faces lost my rifle there afraid i didn't stick my man really because my bayonet struck solid earth i just smashed my fellow we went down into the muck together and another chap trod on my neck for a moment makes you think quick i tell you i pulled that chap down on top of my other bosch and just took one good look to make sure he was a bosch and then i gave him two rounds from my revolver with the barrel in his face i think i killed the under one too but can't be sure next thing i knew we were scrambling on to the second line it was in the wire of the second line that i got my knockout this shoulder and some splinters in my head oh yes bomb i was out of business then but as the light grew i could see my chaps having the time of their lives inside that second line one of em hauled me in after a bit and i got a drink of beer in a big bosch dugout down two separate flights of steps my hat that beer was good though it was german but look here i'm in number five train that that chap's calling i must get ashore just want to tell you about that dugout of g's in our own line you know it was four o'clock in the afternoon and we'd got the bazantine wood all right then when my orderly who never got a scratch was helping me back making for our dressing station we crawled into what had been a trench and while i was taking a breather i sort of looked around and made out a bit here and a bend there begad it was the trench we started from seems nothing but you've no idea how odd it was to me like dropping into a bit of england after about a century and a half in well in some special kind of hell you know seemed so devilish odd that any mortal thing should be the same anywhere after that day not that it was the same really my rum case was in splinters sticking up out of the porridge and i found my map case there torn off my belt as we got over at eight twenty five won't be much left of that dugout i thought and i got my orderly to help me along to see couldn't find the blessed thing anyhow went backwards and forwards three or four times then i spotted the head of a long trench stick that g had carried poking out through soft earth at the back of the trench the orderly worked that stick about a little and the earth fell away it was just loose dry stuff blown off the roof of the dugout and blocking the little entrance came away at a touch almost and there was the little hole you got in by i worried through somehow i was really curious to see if you'll believe me the inside of that dugout it looked like a drawing-room to me after after the outside you know it was just exactly the same as when we'd left it the night before there was the fine stove we made the cafe au lait on with a half-empty box of matches balanced on the side of it and the last empty tin of the coffee stuff we'd used with the broken-handled spoon standing up in it just as i'd left it 
and g s notebook lying open and face down on an air pillow in his bunk most extraordinary homely there was i looking at his notebook and his hold all and poor g dead yes i'd seen his body and the rats too the rats were cavorting around on the felt of the roof happy as sand boys they didn't know anything about the push i suppose by the way we found only dead rats in the boche trenches they say it was our gas i don't know but there were thousands of dead rats there and millions of live fleas very live they were oh, i must get cheerio End of chapter one Chapter two of Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two The Spirit of the British Soldier. There is no vestige of any falling off in the general level of high spirits and confidence among our wounded officers and men from the battlefields of the Somme one writes of battlefields in the plural because in this push there have already been a score and more engagements which as we used to judge war would take rank as very notable and sanguinary battles just as there have been literally many thousands of individual acts which in war as we have known it in the past would have won for those responsible the very highest distinctions we have to offer i don't know what the dispatch writers let alone the military historians are going to do about this psalm fighting said an elderly major wounded in hand and shoulder on the bapaume albert road below pozieres i saw rather a wider sector than some other officers simply because it happened i had to get to and fro several times between our brigade headquarters and three of our battalions i assure you i could easily compile a volume of bald records of individual acts of heroism and the heroism of isolated sections taking only what i saw with my own eyes but i should hesitate to do it because of the implied injustice to the troops on other sectors i've talked with lots of officers between the trenches and here including one divisional staff officer and two of brigade staffs from different parts of our front and i gather the same impression from all the things i saw would have been exceptional very exceptional and the sort of things that pages and pages were written about before this war but they weren't in the least exceptional as incidents of this present push go some things have been happening literally all along our line and during every hour of every day and night since july first does that tally with your experience one asked a company commander who was leaning beside us on the ship's rail waiting for his time to go ashore for the train his left arm was in a sling and bandages were swathed about his head funny i was just asking myself that very question i was just thinking replied captain blank i was wondering how i'd managed if someone asked me for a dozen names from my own company for men to receive distinctions i tell you it would be a devil of a job and one i'd much rather not have suppose i try to think on the other hand of any one man in my company or in what i saw of the rest of the battalion since july first whom i just as soon have been without a man who didn't play the game as well as he might have done gad do you know there's not a blessed one not a single one and what's more i haven't heard of one in any other unit not a single one and one hears a devil of a lot one way and another bucking with this man and the other all the way between there and here you know fraid i'm not much of a praying man but tell you what if i'd set to work praying on the night before we went into this show and mind you i dare say lots of chaps not previously given that way did pray that night it's a big thing you know taking your men into a real large-scale battle for the first time when they were all civilians a little time back and perhaps you were the same yourself if i had on that last night of june i reckon what i should have prayed would have been that my company should accomplish just about half what it did 
upon my soul i shouldn't have dared to ask that they should do all that they actually did when the time came i should have thought that was asking a jolly sight more than was reasonable no i'd have asked for about half what i got and thought myself thundering lucky if i got it as it was i'm perfectly certain that a company of guardsmen with ten years soldiering behind each man of em couldn't have done more than my chaps did they mightn't even have done quite as much you see our chaps felt the honour of the new army was at stake and its reputation all to make we told em what the boche newspapers said about em how kitchener's men didn't count seriously and all that and by gad they went into the scrap like knights of the olden time with their ladies looking on you know as though the new army would stand or fall in history according as each single one of em carried himself in this show you couldn't check em nothing was too bad for em and i give you my word nothing you can possibly say will be too good for em well sergeant what's yours the inquiry was addressed to a fine upstanding sergeant of the middlesex who elected to walk ashore instead of being carried though he was glad of a comrade's shoulder to lean on a year or two ago the question might have suggested an american bar but not on the landing stage at southampton in these days oh i got it just below me thigh there sir nothing to write home about anyway i ought to be back this way again in a week or two i hope i will you see sir the second sergeant in my platoon got it fairly in the neck proper bad i'm afraid he is they do say he may have to lose his right foot anyhow he won't be back for some time if at all and it's bad for the platoon for the two of us to be away now they've made such a fine start i want to be with em and keep em up to it though you wouldn't have said they wanted much keeping up to it sir not if you'd seen em at it i reckon they saved the battalion's flank there between autuy and ovire and there's no sort of doubt they smashed the flank of the boche battalion he'd got a regular nest of typewriters there machine guns i should say sir we stood it for a bit and then my officer he began to get pretty mad with em always was a bit on the hot-tempered side you know sir but as good an officer as ever i served with here damn their german eyes he says just like that when he sees our chaps a droppin we'll get these devils in the flank he says they're not going to get off my platoon that way come on sergeant he says at the double now get those bombers of ours close up here behind me we fairly raced then for their right flank and all there was of us tumbled down into their ditch all of a lump bombers here yells my officer he'd got two machine-gun bullets in him then much he cared for that we got our bombers up and well as my officer said sir we did fairly give em hell after that the platoon went through that trench like a dose of salts as you might say sir worried along it like terriers in a rat earth never so glad in me life to have plenty of bombs we bombed the trench fair empty and any boche that missed the bombs well he got the steel and got it good and hard in and out and in again every time to make sure and that's how our battalion was able to make such a good advance sir the rest of our company was layin doggo while we promenaded down that bloomin trench and when my officer gave the word he'd got a third bullet in him then sir not to mention bomb splinters and the like of that they come on like a cup tie football crowd and the rest of the battalion after them they went over that first line with hardly a casualty barrin just a few from shrap and if they didn't give the boche what for in his second and third lines i'd like to know my officer was fair runnin blood by then he got so many splinters you see sir about the head and face besides the three bullets he got in him i found him sittin on a boche machine-gun lightin a fag a cigarette i should say sir the boche machine-gunner was there too only he'd never smoke no more cigarettes nor fire no more machine-guns he was done up pretty nasty sir was that gunner but his gun was all right because i saw two of our own m g section firing of it not many minutes later i tried to make my officer let me help him back for dressin but he wouldn't have it not then 
he smoked his cigarette while i put the platoon on cleaning out dugouts in that trench i don't mean the mud you know sir we knew we weren't going to hold the trench because we was pushing farther on no but a good many boches had taken cover in them dugouts and what wouldn't come out when we gave em their own bat you know sir come and see here and all that well they had their choice between bomb and bayonet as you might say there was a few of em played the game pretty well i will say they'd a young officer with em and they fired at us as fast as we could get near the mouth of their dugout we didn't want to hurt the beggars but we'd got our job same's they'd had theirs and in the end theirs was bombs in the neck but most of the others jumped to the word and come out quick and lively on the order we got forty-seven of em very little damaged we disarmed the lot and when we joined up with the rest of the company my officer took that bunch of prisoners back to our old lines by himself got two of the biggest to carry him at the rear of the squad on two rifles he had his revolver in one hand and a mills bomb in the other cheero sergeant he says to me keep the boys a movin till i get back but bless you sir they don't want any tellin no more terriers want tellin to get after rats i was wounded half an hour after that and next time i saw my officer was down at the dressin station i only saw the one german officer that boy in the dugout i think that's one reason why the boche is losin heart a bit and shows himself pretty ready to be taken prisoner his officers do keep most uncommon well out of the way very different from ours and i suppose it makes their men feel the game is up but they fight real well till they're right on top of em i'll say that only man for man when it comes to it they can't live longside our chaps you know sir not they end of chapter two chapter three of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the morale of the bosch yes i think you may take it master bosch will never again set foot on the ground we have won from him this month and i think he knows it but although it's mighty hard to get the ground we've got from him is the least of the things we've taken from the german army as i see it the main gain is in the changes wrought in the two armies the huns and ours since july first and that you can't reckon in figures begad there aren't any figures big enough for the reckoning these were the words of lieutenant colonel blank commanding officer of the blank 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 spoken just before he landed from one of the hospital ships his wound one is glad to say is a slight one affecting one hand only and this gallant officer himself regarded with some irritability the action of the medical authorities in separating him from his unit at all at the present time i asked for a dressing and they insist on giving me a trip to blighty however thank goodness i can trust my second in command and i shall be back with my battalion before very many days are over a wounded captain from another battalion was sitting beside us in the companionway and nodded thoughtfully over the colonel's reference to those of our recent gains which cannot be measured in villages or in thousands of yards yes said the captain it's the blow to the boche morale that counts more than the ground morale it's one of those words that people are constantly using said the colonel i wonder if the general public have any very clear idea what it covers they use so many words now which don't really give em pictures and words that don't convey pictures to the average mind aren't very informing you know really when i've been home on leave i found all sorts of people talking glibly of dugouts fire trenches barrages consolidation and so on with never a hint of a picture in their minds of what the words really stand for fighting's a pretty queer business you know when you come to think it out especially this sort of tornado of fighting we get now and for twentieth century man lots of whom never had so much as a shotgun in their hands till a year ago it's more of a miracle than people at home will ever understand is the new army 
and one of the most miraculous things about it is that at the present moment it is carrying on fighting of a kind vastly more terrible than any that the world has ever seen before and mark you carrying it on with as fine a steadiness with as much stubbornness and as much dash too as any veteran army known to history has ever shown and if that isn't something of a miracle well you ask any commanding officer with more than ten years service behind him this business of fighting fighting continuously and cheerily in the presence of devastating casualties has a good deal in common with swimming and bicycling and things of that sort in which instinct plays a big part horse riding too anything that demands perfectly smooth coordination of thoughts nerves muscles and well and spirit the material supplies are essential and in the fighting we've got before us now any failure in the material supplies must mean complete and most bloody failure all along the line but there are other essentials too every experienced leader of soldiers knows it ay and prays over it if he happens to be that sort but i suppose nobody can describe it define it i should say the colonel and the captain were clearly thinking hard in this odd interlude in their journey from shell-swept trenches to quiet english hospitals they nodded occasionally one to another as two men who perfectly understood the matter at hand and entirely agreed that it could not be explained your staff arrangements may be perfect and your material all there you know but if the other thing is missing or weak wrong in any way well the fighting doesn't come off that's all there is about it you can't measure it or weigh it up any more than you can measure a cool breeze on a sultry day but you can feel it rippling through the ranks just as clearly as you can feel the little breeze and god help you if you feel the absence or the failure of it because in fighting there can be no success without it but we've never been without it for a moment in this push the captain nodded slowly and emphatically beating time and underlining his assent with his cigarette i tell you this new army's got it for keeps continued the colonel if you start thinking about the balance and steering of a bicycle you're going to run into the curb or something if you start thinking but if you know hand and mind and nerves all one why she goes like a charm fighting's rather like that plus heat and anger and din and fury and well, fight you know i've been in this show since it began since the morning of the first you know our chaps have remained much the same all through except for one thing at the outset they had duty in their minds doing their bit you know their job now they've got victory in their blood they've got to real grips with the bosch they've found he can fight all right they've seen he's got to and they found he's splendidly equipped but they found something else they found they can beat him they found they're just as well supplied and backed up and a bit better and above all they found that when it comes to actual grips knee-to-knee -knee work they can beat the bosch every time they found they are better men and in better heart which they certainly are that's the only change so far as they're concerned that's the advance they've made and i can tell you it's a mighty big one bigger than anything you'll measure in kilometres but it's not so big as the other part of the advance they've made they've accounted for hundreds of thousands of boches killed wounded and prisoners but they've done more far more they've hit every single boche soldier the german high command have put up against em and hit em very hard and very much where he lives and for aught i know they've hit every other german every hun that lives whether he's in uniform or not by god they have interposed the laconic captain with several emphatic nods double-edged business you see continued the colonel for every ounce of morale you gain you take at least one from the enemy one pound sir at mammoth's anyway said the captain well maybe a pound my point's this the hun poor devil has been very carefully taught the boches are regular artists at propaganda he's been taught 
ever since he scratched into the lines we've taken between Tripoval and Combles, that the very most the contemptible english could ever do would be to hold their line to sit still until such time as the all highest was ready to give the word to sweep them into the sea offensive movement was quite impossible for these make-believe soldiers of ours we were all shopkeepers who did not know one end of a rifle from another and too soft anyhow to stand up for a moment against real live huns once the hun had made up his mind to move we were cruel cowardly devils who would torture and kill any worthy german who was misguided enough to fall into our hands but we were not soldiers our soldiers had all been killed by the valiant german army in the very beginning of the war and a real offensive was utterly impossible for us i've talked to lots of prisoners and i assure you that's the sort of thing they've all been taught and that's what they believed i tell you it would have been better for germany to-day if her leaders had told fewer damned lies in the past better in a thousand ways it would have been a deal better for the hun to-day if they taught their soldiers that the british army was their most deadly and formidable enemy they're beginning to see it now too late their organization is so complete their subjection of their people so brutally thorough and mark you their teaching of their soldiers is so good that they'll go on fighting automatically whatever happens and they are perfectly equipped the materiel is all there the most formidable fighting machinery in the world is there but the indefinable something the thing that enables you to balance and steer your bicycle so easily and naturally without thought the spirit you want to feel rippling through your ranks like a cool breeze if you are to win they've lost that and we've got it got it for keeps people who try to measure the importance of the push by the ground gained or even by the casualties inflicted will fall a long way short in their estimate of what it all means the object in war is the destruction of the enemy and the most important asset enemy has is his spirit the morale of his troops since july first our new army has inflicted a crushing blow upon the enemy's morale with the same troops the boche can never again achieve the same ends with the same troops on our side we can achieve greater ends it's partly the successful bravery and dash and the stubborn endurance of our troops and the tremendous weight of our munitions that have so reduced the boche morale on the somme and it's partly what the boche himself has done in the matter of long and careful teaching based on lies our chaps have let in the light of a little truth into the hun's lines it would have done em no harm if they'd been fed on truth but they've been fed on lies and the new diets upset their digestion in my opinion what's been accomplished this month would have been a big gain to the allies if our casualties had been five times what they have been napoleon may have been right when he said an army marched on its stomach but believe me a modern educated twentieth century army fights on its nerves and spirit and that's where we are immeasurably ahead of the boche and a long way ahead of our position of even last june End of chapter three Chapter Four of Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four An Irish Officer Describes the Indescribable. The mellow Irish voice of Lieutenant M was the first to welcome me on board one of the hospital ships on a recent fine morning. One was glad to find this very popular platoon commander a walking case from others one had already heard much of the fine and dashing work done in the present push by the irish regiment to which m belongs but there were certain other officers whom it was necessary to see at once on this particular steamer and knowing of old lieutenant m s nimbleness with his pen one bade him sit down in the ship's companionway forthwith and write out a full true and particular account of the great push 
give us the realities real pictures something much more informing than any of your letters i have seen he was told perhaps one made some other remarks not conspicuously more reasonable here at all events is what he wrote in indelible pencil on the thin pages of an army book one fifty five the cover of which bore the stains of french trench dust and english blood there may be little here to indicate the dashing gallantry the dogged always cheery bravery of m s irish fighters but it is worth reading all the same and as for bravery well there is not a battalion on the british front between tripol and guillemont which has not earned imperishable honours and distinction since the first of july what you say about my letters home may be entirely deserved my dear skipper but it is also i think quite unavoidable even apart from the necessary censor restrictions let me tell you sir as one not wholly devoid of practical literary experience that what you are looking for is simply not to be had the business of this push of any other important phase of the war for that matter is too big for letters bedad it is too big for literature itself you won't get it on paper you can get little bits yes and much good they will do you almost any one bit written is calculated to mislead the innocent why because taken by itself it is essentially untrue it is only true when seen as it is seen in reality one chip in a mosaic looked at all on its lonesome it is essentially false why if you'll believe me the colonel of the battalion next ours borrowed a handkerchief from me to blow his blessed nose with in the middle of one of the bloodiest little shows that ever was got a handkerchief to spare he said in a casual sort of way i used mine tying up a fellow's arm back there i gave him my handkerchief he blew his nose comfortably and shoved the rag in his breeches pocket that's better says he and hurried on with the advance he was with the rear company of his battalion and the way he managed to get in and out among his men cheering them on was wonderful he was rather badly wounded later on in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with four boches who had cornered two of his men in their second line but he's all right i think men were dropping all around us in that advance it was an extraordinarily bloody business and had been for thirty hours and more before that but one remains human you understand one tries to get a mouthful of grub at certain intervals and a smoke if possible and a man wants to blow his nose on occasion even though all hell's let loose and well some of us prefer to use handkerchiefs for that purpose if we can you follow me but how easy to convey an entirely false impression with a picture of a commanding officer borrowing a handkerchief and blowing his nose in the midst of a hot advance suppose i set out to depict something of the shapeless grisly horrors of it all god knows there's enough of em what's the best effect i'll produce especially on any one who's never been out there an effect of shapeless confused purposeless horror well is the push no more than that you bet it is why looked at from one point of view it is positively beautiful from the platoon standpoint it may be a colossal lark or a tangled horror whilst from the high staff standpoint the main impression well may be one of mathematical nicety perfectly dovetailed detail and smooth working precision to give you an instance the other afternoon i came mighty near to puking in a warren of boche trenches we took outside longueve nothing much we've all seen worse things a little heap of four dead boches they were decently buried an hour later it just happened i was about the first of our people to see this particular shambles you know how careful our chaps are with their kindly sense of decency their first thought is to cover a dead boche's face give him some decent dignity even if they're not able at the moment to give him decent burial english irish scots canadian australian south african all the british troops are like that well they hadn't had time to clean up here and these particular boches had been done up pretty nasty as they say very nasty indeed 
some of our heavy stuff must have landed right among em they were in the mouth of a dugout right two minutes later i came upon as homely a little picture as you'd find in the neighbourhood of any peaceful irish or english village three of our lads crouching over an old brazier on which they were making afternoon tea if you please frying a scrap of bacon and boiling the water for tea at the same time and stirring in their own lovable irish blarney with the cooking all the time i took it in and passed on pondering the queerness of the whole business i wasn't more than sixty or seventy paces away when three boche shells arrived like a postman's knock somewhere close behind just three and no more one of the flukes of the day something made me turn back and go to take another look at the tea-party one of its members had been instantaneously killed his head smashed to a pulp another had been horribly mauled about the loins and was already being attended to by a couple of stretcher-bearers who had been resting in a dugout within sight of the party and themselves had been covered with earth and dust from the shells i lent a hand and they very soon had the poor chap on his way down to the dressing-station but i feel sure one won't ever see him again you know that hopeless yellow pallor it was blank of number seven and the man killed was blank of number five i was back that way within a quarter of an hour and there was blank of blank's own section you know rolling a cigarette in a bit of newspaper having just finished the bacon his half-filled canteen of tea was alongside the brazier which lay now on its side upset no doubt when the shells came indeed it was half buried but blank told me the bacon had been saved and in some queer way the tea so he had had blank's whack and blank's as well as his own and as he rolled his cigarette in the scrap of a sunday newspaper he was humming keep the home fires burning my dear skipper you can no more hope to get the push described for folk who haven't been out than you can hope to get the world described or human life explained on a postcard the pen may be ever so mighty but believe me it has its limitations what's the push like it's like everything that ever was on land or sea and nothing that ever was as well it's all the struggles of life crowded into an hour it's an assertion of the bedrock decency and goodness of our people and i wouldn't have missed it not for all the gold in london town i don't want to be killed not a little bit but bless you one simply can't be bothered giving it a thought the killing of odd individuals such as me is so tiny a matter my god skipper it's the future of humanity countless millions all the laughing little kiddies and the slim straight young girls and the sweet women and the men that are to come it's all humanity we're fighting for whether life's to be clean and decent free and worth having or a bosh nightmare you can't describe it but i wouldn't like to be out of it for long it's hell and heaven and the devil and the world and thank goodness we're on the side of the angels decency not material gain and we're going to win end of chapter four chapter five of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five close quarters among those who were permitted to board a certain hospital ship when she berthed at southampton was lieutenant h an officer of the territorials whose battalion accomplished some fine work at Pozieres. this officer was sent home during the early part of the somme offensive slightly wounded and will by now have returned to duty he had not taken half a dozen steps on the vessel's deck before he was saluted by a private of his own battalion whose jacket was thickly coated with the grime of later fighting at Pozieres and spattered over with blood as to its left shoulder in the powwow that followed one tried to get as accurate a record as possible of this man's own words this was about the way of it 
i found your glasses and sticks sir close to where the stretcher-bearers were hung up that time you remember sir that little dead end where there had been an old french dugout there was a big gas gong hanging there you may remember sir on the haft of a broken pick in the side of the trench i gave them to sergeant blank so they wouldn't be lost the platoon's in clover now sir they were coming out for rest when i was taken away it was after the posier scrappin was over i got my second wound getting back down the new sap we made my first was nothing machine-gun bullet the platoon's to have two or three days rest i believe sir seems queer resting back there in what used to be the boche mines you know sir they're ours now all right and some of the deep dugouts are first-rate came through the crumping all right they did that place the blanks raided you know sir in june it was when the prisoners started scrappin on the way back across no man's land you could see our chaps lying about there smokin and usin their tommy cookers now but we had a hot time all right after you left sir the way it was when you left it went on just the same not a minute's break for the rest of the night all day long and the next night before any ease up came but captain blank said the platoon had done real well sir what there was left of us you could see he was pleased and the commanding officer sir he said we was a credit to the regiment so i think you can feel all right about the platoon sir we were moved up to the right our company after you left and were next the australians and i must say they did fight like men sir but not any more than our boys there was a bit of racin like between us there you know sir and one of the anzac corporals told me we made it easy for em but that must have been his blarney sir because there wasn't nothin easy for anybody in such a hell as that posier's was i thought at first being dark would make it better for us but now i think the daylight best we got to that road at last you know sir it seemed we never could because of their machine guns but we did and the boche he had it fair honeycombed with deep dugouts and trenches but we put the wind up him properly when we got there sir my word we did and those what was left was pretty glad to get their hands up after the cruel time they'd given us on the slope our boys did want a mix-up at the end but mr blank and captain blank they wouldn't have it sir they were runnin up and down our line tellin us about it and captain blank he was near chokin for want of breath but he shouted all he could and kept all on puttin himself between the boches with their hands up and us and every one of the boches was taken prisoner and not a one hurt it's right too of course when they surrender when the order came for our platoon to hold on to that little ridge above where you was hit sir i must say i thought it couldn't be done we was all alone you know sir and when they tried to bring up another platoon they had to be recalled for the boche he had that ground so swept with his typewriters a swaller couldn't have flown there five separate times the hun came down on us and when he wasn't chargin he was crumpin and machine gunnin something chronic if you lifted your head to look just for a second you got it in the neck every time when we got the reinforcement up that night from number eight and number seven there was only one of us hadn't been hit that was little joey green in my section you know sir but we were able to keep the lewis gun going when they were charging i think that's what saved us really sir couldn't use it only when they was chargin or it would have been blowin out of action in a second but we peppered em all right when their fire lifted to let em charge a good little gun sir though it did get red hot i tell you sir i felt like blessin the chaps that made it so's it could stick the job and the chaps that fired it too when they'd been plenty badly wounded you see sir we was all right with the bayonet so long as it was only maybe two boches for each of us when they charged we could manage that pretty comfortable but if it hadn't been for the lewis i think we'd have had half a dozen boches to each one of us every time he charged and i don't think we could have stood it i had a little parapet of three of em head to tail in front of me and i reckon that sheltered me quite a lot i've got their three caps and bayonet sheaths here that i tied on the back of me belt 
the fifth time the boche charged i stopped one with a bullet just before he could reach my bayonet and the one behind him threw down his rifle and shouted mercy with his hands over his head i wouldn't a hurt him didn't want to hurt the beggar you know sir though you'd be pretty sick to see one of our boys do the like of that but it seemed he couldn't help himself and he ran right on to my bayonet spitted himself he did i did my very best to patch up the last one but it was no go he snuffed it sir while i was fixin my field dressing on him i felt sorry for that bosch in a way seein i hadn't wanted to hurt him at all i suppose they can't help bein different from our chaps mercy camarade and all that and here is another little story of a private soldier who did his bit on the left of Pozieres. A company quartermaster sergeant, who was wounded by a stray bullet at a ration dump well behind the lines, gave me a note for an officer now in hospital in London. I found out what hospital he was in from the RAMC staff, and wired asking permission for the publication of the note I was sending him. His reply was, anything you like that will do justice to as fine a lot of men as any officer ever had well i don't think this little note does them any injustice anyhow i am bringing you the wristlet watch that was on blank's wrist because the other batman told me it was yours and only lent to blank as i am told you are somewhere in london sir i dare say you may be seeing his family he was with the front line on the left of Pozieres with the rest of his platoon his mates tell me his rifle had been knocked out of his hand the shell-holes there must have been hard to cross at the double in the dark with such a heavy fire on too but blank somehow managed to down his man all right when they found him he had a boche's bayonet and rifle in his right hand and his left hand was at the throat of the boche he'd killed he was lying right across the man and he had a bullet through his head we think a machine-gun bullet got him while he struggled with the boche on the ground after sticking him with his own bayonet so you see sir your batman died pretty game like the rest of our boys who went west but i am glad to say our casualties have been pretty light on the whole when you think of the masses of boche dead not to mention the prisoners i hear the brigadier is very pleased indeed with the battalion's work and that many in our company will be mentioned in dispatches the sergeant-major sent his best respects and hopes your wound is healing well we have been doing fine lately in the matter of boots and socks and the rations and bath arrangements have been going like clockwork since you had it out with blank sir End of chapter five Chapter Six of Psalm Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: The Devil's Wood. No, don't know anything about Pozieres. We're from Devia Wood, all three of us. Oh, I don't know. There may have been worse places, you know. But it was pretty hot shop when we were there. Not exactly a health resort, you know. Anyhow if pozieres was worse it must have been quite nasty they were all three walking cases seated at that moment in the companion of the red cross ship just berthed their bandages were clean and i have no doubt their wounds were also clean but for the rest all that was visible of those three subalterns was blank well it had too much of Devilla wood about it to be clean one feels that some of these tattered blood and soil stained uniforms should be preserved precisely as they are when their wearers step ashore at southampton no doubt some will be proud mothers and sisters should see to it devilla wood for example one example among many will remain a tremendous memory for a good many of our heroes of all ranks and two a marked point in history i did get one cigarette or half of it as a matter of fact in devil's wood said the fair-haired subaltern whose bloody tunic had been holed over the right shoulder-blade as well as slashed to ribbons in front but that was a fluke i was in quite a deep hole then you remember that place blank just below the left drive mostly the only way to get a moment's comfort in devil's wood was to get out of it dead or alive 
and there were times when you felt it didn't matter much which oh i say come off protested the dark boy who after a course of turkish baths might have posed for an artist specialising in cherubic choristers it was never so bad as all that sir it's rather good to have something to chew in a place like that seems to mitigate the stinks too i had milk tablets jolly good things it did niff a bit didn't it said number three always used to think dead boches were the most satisfactory kind of huns never thought one could see too many but there were rather too many at delville must say i didn't like em especially at night when a fellow was crawling about flies too there were more flies than one really wanted in delville oh damn i hate those flies one was always thinking about what they'd lit on last really did it strike you that way i can't say i had much time for thinking about the beggars but i noticed they were a bit thick flies like blood you know do they well davies woods the place for em then plenty blood there my aunt i saw boches there bled white the ground all around em soaked hm our own too by god that northern strip was a hot shop how many machine-guns do you reckon the boche had there like a typewriting shop wasn't it but it was rather jolly when fatty got our little lewis up in front there wasn't it made the rifle seem a bit slow there's a good deal of solid comfort in a lewis you know if you can find a decent shell-hole handy i liked the red spit of it in the night pretty comforting that when you heard the boches creeping that was one of the things about the wood you never could move in it without making some row row but did you ever hear anything like the row our heavies made in that last hurricane burst i was trying to explain to my sergeant just what we were going to do when the curtain lifted and pawn my word though i yelled in his ear he couldn't hear me fine that wasn't it the scramble when it lifted god it was a great fight that last bit our chaps had their teeth set then all right one of my section commanders was wounded in three places before we started but he went like an absolute madman in that scramble up the little ridge never saw anything like it in my life his face was covered with blood he'd got no coat and his shirt had been all torn away in putting field dressings on him nobody could keep up with him i tried hard but he got ahead of me and he downed two big boches in that shallow trench as though they'd been thistles just smothered them he did and then then he got it fairly in the neck bomb burst right at his feet laid out three other chaps at the same time he was a man that chap i got a bit of his own back for him it was a boche sergeant shied that bomb at blank but he'll never throw another i beg pardon no no i i hadn't got a rifle then but i had my little trenchin though and it was good enough oh i don't think he was the surrendering kind anyway he didn't get the chance blank was one of my own section commanders you see and one of the best yes i made quite sure about that particular boche he wasn't a bad sort put up a good enough fight ay ay a queer business you know there were some real brave things done at the end of that show they can't give d c m s to every one you know but honestly all those men earned it just as well as any of the chaps who get it oh, of course they did so do thousands every day in the push thousands of em every day are doing bigger finer things than lots of things men got the v c for in the old days the old days are of course the days before fourteen to these young veterans god bless em yes but look here what i was thinking of was the lot of things that nobody at all ever knows about not even a man's own mates now look here you know we had to fall back a bit once from that shallow trench at the top no i mean after we'd been in it and thought we'd got it yes well we fell back for oh must have been ten minutes the time i mean and a lot of the boches came up along those communicating saps and it almost looked once as though we wouldn't get it back again never looked any other way i thought can't for the life of me see how the devil we ever did get it 
damn it it was obviously impossible to get it because of those machine guns i know well i got my dose in the trench you know when i saw you all falling back i tried like the devil to get out i was in quite a deep bit alongside that traverse with the big tree on it where blank was killed i nearly broke blood vessels trying to get out but it was no go my shoulder was giving me hell and the right arm wouldn't work at all well you know i'd rather have been sent west altogether i always did feel i'd rather be anything than be taken by the boches i had my revolver of course but i'm not much good with my left hand ten to one they'd have got me alive i could just see over the edge and i was cursing my luck when i saw a chap deliberately stop turn round and look at me and sort of weigh up his chances he was falling back with the rest of our lot you know just then a boche machine-gun opened as it seemed right alongside me it was really just round the big traverse that settles it i thought i'm done now and it did settle it too that chap i'd seen who'd evidently decided once that it wasn't good enough he altered his mind when the typewriter began down on his hands and knees he went and scuttled all the way back to where i was like a lizard he fairly gasped at me no breath you know on my back sir says he and somehow he hauled me out and slung me over his back i fell off three separate times while he was scrambling down the slope with me and three separate times he stopped in all that fire and fixed me up again and then i felt him crumple up under me and at the same time i got this through the left arm i rolled clear and looked at his face i'll never forget his face but he had no coat or cap and i didn't know his battalion his forehead was laid open and bleeding fast i dragged him behind a stump and laid him with his head on my haversack then i scrambled out to find a stretcher-bearer for him but i got caught up in our advance then you know what it is and i went on thinking i'd find my man after glad i went in a way because i had three bombs a wounded corporal gave me and it was easy lobbing them with my left at close quarters by gad i lobbed em all right nearly lobbed myself to kingdom come too but those bombs did their job all right before we cleared the trench it was hours after before i could get a man to help me look for that good chap who dragged me out and we never found him never a sign of him but to do what he did thinking it out too in all that hell why many a chap's got the v c for no more than that i think yes and there were dozens of things like that at delville alone same all along the front right through the push i believe it is pon my word i'm dead sure of it oh i tell you as the men say the army of to-day's all right london train oh yes that's me orderly come on boys i beg your pardon good-bye sir end of chapter six chapter seven of psalm battle stories by alec john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the cockney fighter among the wounded who arrived recently at southampton one found both officers and men whose experiences since july first may be described as unique in all the world's history of war these are men who went over the sticks at seven thirty a m on july first and have been fighting at one point or another in the present great offensive north of the somme ever since there are of course magnificent soldiers in the french army who have been through an even longer period of fighting at verdun and the fighting before verdun was probably the most intense recorded in history up to that time but as a french officer stated only the other day after returning wounded from the south of peron the british part in the somme offensive has been verdun magnified verdun on a bigger scale 
another french officer has stated that the artillery fire in some portions of this line has been more terrible more intense more devastating than the worst seen at verdun when one carefully thinks out what the day-to-day -day and night-to-night -night fighting has been between autuy and guimont since july first and then comes to talk to a soldier who has actually been through the whole of it one marvels that any ordinary twentieth-century human being could possibly survive such a month so spent one talked with many on the landing stage who not only have survived it but can jest about it and talk with indomitable cheeriness about getting back to it before the show's over private a blank blank of the blank blank will retain always a prominent place in my gallery of such wounded heroes who have not the faintest notion that there is anything heroic about them he is a cockney of the cockneys i have met his like in the ranks of the old army the territorials and the new armies but never certainly one who has shown such months as private a has just lived through never before this year fed up what are sirs fed up sir not likely why we're just beginning to like it but i bet mr bosch is getting a bit fed up least some air them as i saw they was right up to the bloomin neck as you might say sir but i feel there is something terribly inadequate about my attempt to reproduce private a's racy vernacular also i cannot hope to convey on paper any conception of the incorrigibly humorous devilry in the man's mobile face brave i would say he was braver than a stoat and that may mean something to any one who has known a stoat defy him and his stick on a footpath who has been deliberately challenged as i have been to mortal combat with a stoat over the body of a crippled field mouse private a got his quietus in delville wood three separate times before after july first he was slightly wounded and received all the attention he would accept at advanced field dressing stations in delville wood he went on fighting for a good time with considerable wounds in left shoulder and arm and only gave out when rendered perfectly helpless by a smashed ankle and two slight head wounds to ear the why they talks about that devil's wood you'd think there was something wrong about the bloomin place for me i like the in and out close work i do better than this bloomin extended work done in the open with the bloomin typewriters chick clackin till you can't hear yourself speak and they can't hardly help hittin a yer either same's it was at montebang and comin up longyville now give me the in and out work i say every time you do get a bit of fun for your money in a place like devil's wood i've done a bit of scrappin down at wonderland i have and when my officer gave me a little trench dagger what fitted on me left and like a knuckle-buster he had two or three of em he had why i tell you it was a little bit of or light for me there's something to keep a man amused about that sort of fightin not like this open order work where you never knows who's it's sure i didn't arf walk into them boches when we rushed em in the wood not arf i didn't time gentlemen i used to say much i cared about their toastin forks once i could get close in you let me get close in sir same's we did in devil's wood time and time again and i'll back myself to serve you up boches fast as you can open oysters no i've got no fault to find with devil's wood if only a r e fatigue party could a got in there first and done a bit o clean-up as you might say got some o the wood and wire and rubbish and that out o the way and just levelled it up a bit why you couldn't have asked for a nicer place for a scrap what do i think o master bosch ah oh, he's all right once you get to know his little tricks the blighter he's got some tarbly dirty little tricks but he's a sticker you know sir yes he's a sticker all right especially with a machine-gun he don't count once you can land him one on the point o the jaw the sight of steel makes him proper sick you oughter be quick as a flash once you get up to him or he'll up with his hands and then you mustn't touch the beggar although you know bloomin well that if you happen to stumble or give him half a chance he'll stick yer when you're not lookin almost the only time he will that is 
but he's a pretty good soldier at shootin ranges the push ah oh, the push is all right sir tyke it a bit or time you know to flatten em out proper but he's goin to be flattened all right not arf he ain't did i get any sleep last month lor bless ye yes sir i can't get on without me sleep we used to doss it in shell holes any old place soon got used to that ad me tea too sir most afternoons i did bit of a relish with it too when we got to a bosch trench i'd say that for the boches their dugouts is prime generally I always find a bit or something tasty in a bosch dugout and if you strike a, a officer's dugout it's a lord mayor's banquet for certain it is impossible for me to begin to do justice to private a on paper i wish he could meet some of our literary masters of cockney humour for though what i am able to quote may not faintly indicate it men like this are perfectly wonderful in their attitude toward the great things they have seen and done this man who is only one among thousands has moved and lived and had his hourly being night and day for many weeks past in a nearer approach to the old writer's dream of hell than anything ever previously seen on earth not for an hour in all that time has he been out of reach of gunfire or away from the maniacal den the murderous fury of it all he is now pretty badly cut about and has lost a lot of blood but he hardly ever opens his mouth without emitting a jest of some kind he talks cheerily of getting back into the inferno and very probably will be back there before very many weeks have passed as for delvilla which several officers have told me was the most awful and bloody shambles of the whole terrific series he says that by its untidiness so to say you couldn't have asked for a nicer place for a scrap if the kaiser could produce many such soldiers as this well the war would last a very long time myself i greatly doubt if the all highest could produce one such among all his legions and i have talked with many scores of just this type and hundreds of other types as fine in their different ways during the past few weeks alone it is to be remembered always that this is the spirit they show when wounded and straight from the most exhausting kind of fighting ever seen and a long tiring journey heaven help the hun who meets them when with all the knowledge they have gleaned of his little ways they re-enter the fight at the end of comfortable weeks of good living and recuperation end of chapter seven chapter eight of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight we don't count wounds in my regiment standing close beside the gangway of the first hospital ship to be berthed at southampton during one recent day was a tall fair-haired sergeant who came to attention and saluted like a guardsman on parade though his left arm was slung and his tunic in tatters the dust which covered his ragged jacket was caked on it by darker thicker stuff than water the familiar unmistakable stain which covers so much khaki on hospital ships the stain that tells you a man has given freely of the life within him in the service of king and country there was nothing in these details to hold one's attention to the sergeant for these are external characteristics shared by most of our new arrivals at southampton but in some indescribable way the sergeant was trim and smart though bandaged and clothed in rags that were muddy and bloody his smartness then must have gone a good way beneath the surface it certainly was marked i waited a few minutes to chat with this n c o and it happened that the first question i put to him took this form well sergeant how do you think the new army is shaping there was something at once humorous modest and very pleasing about his flickering half-smile the new army sir oh i think the new army's all right sir doin fine i should say master bosch finds em a pretty tough nut to crack i think i don't think there's much the matter with the new army sir from the little i've seen of it why haven't you been out long there sergeant 
again that flickering modest humorous smile i was in the retreat from mons sir wounded there and hit again at loose sir this is my third trip home in a hospital ship but of course it's all different now then you are of the old army fourteen years service sir come next month hm when you come out of hospital this time you'll wear three gold stripes sergeant the smile was perfectly radiant this time we don't count wounds in my regiment sir it would be most difficult to explain how much this sergeant impressed me or what was conveyed by his smile and his tone there was for example a kind of caress in his voice when he used those two simple words my regiment which i am quite sure cannot be described some hours later on another ship i had some little talk about it with an officer of the regular army a captain whose majority cannot be far from him i apprehend he has seen service in gallipoli as well as in france and been wounded in both theatres of war odd you should mention that he said i've been thinking of that very point the new army and the old i put in two days and a night at havre you know on the way from the front and some kind soul has supplied the place i was in with stacks of newspapers i read papers of every day for a month all about the present offensive i was awfully glad to see the public have been getting lots of information about the way the service battalions have distinguished themselves i think they deserve every word of praise they've got and more they really are wonderful it's a great achievement for men to be so steady in attack after so short a training their officers have done splendidly too and it's good that the public at home should learn something about it i very much doubt if any other country in the world could have accomplished anything approaching to it in the time tradition counts for an enormous deal you see in any army in the training and the fighting men make soldiers of one another you know given the tradition and the atmosphere and in the absence of these things to have accomplished what this country has accomplished in the new army well it's a wonderful tribute to the qualities of the race nobody knows so well as a regular soldier what a wonderful miracle it is i forget just how my next question was worded but i know it provoked frank and hearty laughter from the captain oh lord no he said no need to tell the public about the regulars they don't need any telling about regiments that have been fighting in different parts of the world for centuries the world hardly wants telling at this time of day that tommy is an invincibly fine soldier the very best he proved it such a long time ago and he's been proving it ever since but it's only right that our people should be given all the facts about the new army it had to prove itself and begad it's done it magnificently i don't think there can be a shadow of doubt about that but i do think it's only right and fair that the facts which prove it should be made public everybody who's been in the show knows it but the world ought to know it too as for us well they know all about us don't they of course it's a mistake to suppose that we have two separate fighting forces old army and new army it isn't that at all the service battalions as you know are mostly battalions of regiments whose records were fine records before the german empire was ever thought of some of em have been lucky enough to get a certain number of regular n c o s and some a few regular officers some have been luckier than others in the matter of the number of ex-regulars they got in their ranks those things are a great help of course in the training as well as in the campaign the old regular senior n c o or warrant officer is a finely finished production as you know a pretty valuable centre of influence there are battalions and companies in the new army that owe an enormous deal to a single regular sergeant-major and there are service battalions with retired regular officers commanding whose training has made them equal to any line battalion in the world 
then of course there are plenty of regular battalions with hardly a score of the old hands left in the ranks they have done their bit from first to last and done it so well that they have had to be remade many times over from drafts but the regiment never dies you know the root of the matter is there all the time and the surviving officers and n c o s work pretty hard to prevent any falling off in its quality i think perhaps that's really the whole thing isn't it a strictly non-military nation has in an extraordinarily short space of time built up a huge army from the very closely pollarded stem of a little one which well perhaps the arch hun did make a bit of a mistake when he described it as contemptible as well as little its record wasn't exactly contemptible was it the root is the old root and the present big tree seems to me to have the old fibre running all through it can't very well give it a higher praise can you and mind you it deserves the highest praise that can be given as i think the bosch is beginning to realize end of chapter eight chapter nine of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine a reverend corporal the last wounded man i talked with on the landing stage at southampton on a certain night was in hospital away up north next morning his two wounds were both clean and slight and within a week or so he would no doubt be enjoying sick leave in his own border country home wherever he is he will i think be an influence for good and yes i am sure of it a greater influence for good than he could have been if he had played no part in this war he is a corporal now and his name was in his battalion orderly room for a lance sergeant stripes when he stopped the bullets that gave him his break for rest and recuperation in blighty up till some time early in nineteen fifteen he was a minister of the gospel newly ordained when the end of the war comes he will resume his sacred calling and one would like to hear him preach i am very sure he will not have lost anything as preacher teacher or minister by his service in another capacity a man does not lose by the teaching of discipline and the experience of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder comradeship in the trenches with men who voluntarily offer their lives in the defence of all that every good man holds sacred this corporal's face and neck and hands are of a rich old saddle brown and his eyes despite the weariness in them have a light which it is good to see in the eyes of a man he knows a very great deal more about many things including life and british human nature than he knew eighteen months ago and he has found it all well worth fighting for dying for if need be as he has seen many of his comrades die i was just north of Ovillers, where the new line joins the old you know we are practically at right angles to our old lines there you know looking north now instead of east and in our rear you can walk about and take your ease in the warren that stood for death to us before july first and what a warren round about Ovillers and la boiselle i mean it's marvellous to think those lines could ever have been taken i am not a bit surprised the hun thought them impregnable any one would when you come to look over them even now when they have been pounded out of all recognition by our heavies you'd think such a network could be held against any possible advance the boche thinks the same about the April you know that no power on earth will ever take it from him because he's made a fortified arsenal of it but there's a force behind our chaps that he can never have in this war and i doubt if his generals make any allowance for that and yet you know that force whatever you like to call it will presently smash the Etville just as surely as it smashed ovier and la boiselle and the other impregnable strong points 
i'm no expert of course but it seems queer to me that these highly trained people who run the bosch machine should show the ignorance they do of everything they can't weigh and measure and touch with their fingers it's been the same all through the war from the very first outrage in belgium so far the bosch would seem to be incapable of grasping the existence of anything that cannot be turned out of a foundry of course i know the foundry has played a tremendous part in the war and i know the bravest heart can't go on beating after you've smashed it with a bosch shell but that doesn't alter my point really shells alone would i think have left places like la boiselle and Ovier what the bosch thought them impregnable but behind and over and above our shelves without which we can i know do nothing our fellows have something which the boches have not got in this war or in their nation as at present constituted and believe me it's that something that's winning the war for us and our allies oh i'm no authority of course but just as it's their job to know all about tactics and munitions so it was mine and is to know a little about men's souls or spirits to try hard to learn about them anyhow to study them all i can i've been studying more closely since i joined up than i ever did before and the study has brought me two certainties that the german army and the german nation have set themselves a perfectly hopeless task and that they cannot possibly prevail against us and that the allies will presently beat the germans absolutely to a standstill more than anything else because of elements at work on our side which germany does not recognize or understand and of which her magnificent organization has taken no account at all oh, am i preaching forgive me it boils down to this their machinery for destroying our flesh and bones is pretty good though i think we have mastered that this year thanks to our unarmed armies in the home workshops but they have devised nothing adequate to put up against the spirit of our armies in the field nothing adequate at all and yet mark my words that it is that that is going to carry us through their lines it's that that is going to enable me to smoke my pipe in the midst of their fortified arsenal at the Epho when i get back i'm just as certain of it as i am that i smoked a pipe the night before i was hit in the middle of what in june was such an utterly deadly place for us as the chalky trench walls beyond mash valley between ovieres and la boiselle whether or not there was logic in his words there was a conviction behind them which i found most compelling that is one reason why i want to hear this corporal preach after the war i asked for further details as to this asset of ours against which the hun has made no provision tell me what this spirit is i asked ah i'm afraid i can't do that i'm not so very sure that any one could you can't measure it remember and it's not made in factories it would be so easy to use words that would mislead you words that might mean one thing for me and another for you and i don't really think that any words could do justice to it anyhow it is there all right i can assure you men cannot march smilingly into certain death with a cheer on their lips without it specially primed men may be driven anywhere as we have seen boches driven but our chaps are not primed and never driven yet the boche cannot make them waver no it is beyond me to describe it i think perhaps one must live among our fellows in the trenches to understand it rightly our officers know all about it the boche fights because he's got to fight our chaps fight because well the fact that as soldiers they have got to fight is the least of the things that make them fight for one thing they know as well as i do that we are going to win they came forward voluntarily to fight because they know we ought to win and that for our sort of people for people holding the sort of beliefs the british people hold life wouldn't be worth living ever if we didn't win 
but i feel that the words i am using are quite futile such little shadows beside the thing itself i fancy the public will get as near understanding it as anybody can without living in the trenches and seeing the spirit at work among the men if they just think carefully over what our men have been going through on that front what they have been doing since july and how they have done it cheering singing shouting how gladly they have done it then let the public ask themselves how and why the most of the men of the new armies have no military tradition behind them had never handled a gun till they joined up yet they have faced bigger things than any veterans ever faced before and faced them steadily ah so steadily seeing it all very clearly and fearing it not one scrap though they have forced mad fear into the highly trained troops facing them again and again that is because they have something that you cannot make in foundries that you cannot even give by training words don't explain it but quiet thought may i could give it a name the church would recognize but let's just say they know their cause is good as they very surely do the germans may write on their badges that god is with them but our lads they know End of chapter 9。chapter 10 of some battle stories by Alec John Dawson。this librivox recording is in the public domain。chapter 10 。brothers of the parsonage。there have been busy phases of the day's work at southampton when two of the green and white hospital ships have been lying alongside the stage together both with full passenger lists of wounded from the somme on one such occasion the living freight of the smaller boat was still being discharged when i went on board the big one there one was talking with one of the cot cases whose foot had been rather badly knocked about by a german bomb in his pleasure in the fact that it was his foot and not his head which caught the more malevolent portions of that particular bomb lieutenant r seemed to think it was rather an advantage than otherwise to lose a toe or two nothing to write home about anyhow was his way of putting it one had occasion to ask his name this high-spirited fellow who thought himself so extraordinarily lucky to have nothing more than a temporarily smashed foot and then i turned back to another page of my notebook why there's another man of your name i said on board the blank lying just astern here you don't mean to say it's teddy don't know i'm sure here's the name look second lieutenant e s r of the umth and umth well i'll be jiggered if it isn't teddy i say you must excuse me you know but that's my elder brother he must have been in this show too they only came out about christmas time you know and i never knew where his brigade was how was he hit how is he is he a cot case or a walker how'd he seem does he look all right what an extraordinary lark fancy teddy being what five minutes later one had secured permission from the kindly r a m c staff officer for teddy the senior in years was the junior in rank i noticed to leave his ship and come on board the other vessel till his train was ready it was rather pleasant to watch the meeting of the two brothers who had been in france for eight months without either knowing precisely where the other was teddy was a walking case as it happened so that there was no difficulty about his getting to his brother he had been hit when fighting beside the bas -Pomme road close to pozieres his brother on the terrible northern slope of delvi wood above Longueva one rather wished one had a phonograph in which to record some of the talk that passed between these two sons of an english country parson who had last met during their training period in nineteen fifteen in a sequestered south country rectory and had since lived through many months of strenuous trench warfare and some weeks of such strife 
as the world has never seen before all between the ancre and the somme both have known winter in waterlogged trenches and abysmal mud both have gasped and spat from the choking thirst that comes to a fighting man during july and august heats on a chalky soil when he struggles in blinding dust and dense choking smoke over ground which has been pulverized in almost every yard of it by bursting high explosive and rending steel they had a good deal to say and some of it was not very coherent or easy for the outsider to follow both were in the same tearingly high spirits men wounded and broken in the war it was hard to believe it as one watched their sparkling eyes and the constant flash of white teeth against dark sunburnt skin while they laughed in sheer gaiety of heart wounded perhaps and one felt that would not affect them for long but these english lads are not so easily broken there is a good deal of the born fighter in them despite our non-military traditions and for one who knows the trenches in northern france it is striking evidence of enduring virility and invincible good-heartedness to find men so amazingly debonair and in the towering spirits of holiday schoolboys after eight or nine months spent in the fighting line between fricourt and arras this is a specimen of the sort of verbal battledore and shuttlecock which went on between the junior superior officer in the cot and the senior of lower rank who was a walking case fancy you you secretive old beggar being here and i never even knew you were in the show well what about you if you come to that you got it in the foot eh what is it shrap no bomb yours in the arm you old blighter shoulder in up here near the collarbone and out through the shoulder blade machine gun bullet clean as can be i'll be clear in a week or two what the deuce do you want to get a bomb in the foot for what were you doing oh i was jolly lucky i can tell you we were rushing their last trench in the davilla wood weren't more than a dozen paces in front of it i fell regular somersault in a shell hole at the very moment one of their bombs went off right alongside me head down in the hole safe you see heels up and one of em got caught but my orderly got the boche who shied it got him for keeps i can tell you first boche he'd killed i think and begad he made no end of a mess of the chap insisted on giving me the fellow's helmet here it is look though as i told him it was more up to me to be giving him something he seemed to think it was a gross kind of insubordination for the boche to have shied a bomb at his officer nice boy mother keeps a little shop of sorts in blank we must get the mater to look her up so you were up there by posieres oh, a bit southwest of it hot stuff wasn't it posieres oh, so so not a rest cure you know i've got a helmet too but i can beat you me boy mine's an officer's a real live bosch officer least he was live enough then with a sword stick of all things and i've got his sword stick too no teddy what a lark did you really get the beggar well he got me first punctured my left hand here you see i'd lost my revolver long before but i'd got a bosch rifle and bayonet pretty good one too you'd have laughed to see the duel like a naval and military tournament show you know sword versus bayonet i dare say he was a swordsman lots of those huns are you know if so i spect my ignorance of the game put him off i simply rushed him you know got him clean through the chest queer thing he was the only bosch officer i've seen and we've been in front ever since the first oh i know they've been lying remarkably doggo getting a bit short i suppose else they've lost their appetite how'd your men do finest platoon in the new army bar none oh come i swear they're not that can't be i've got the best every one in our lot knows that but yours were good were they good my dear chap there isn't a man in the platoon that oughtn't to have the v c not a blessed one hm so yours were the same huh 
mine were absolutely perfect i knew they were fine but honestly i'd no idea how fine till we got into davia honest injun a man can't help loving em oh i know it's queer isn't it the way you feel that you really can't help loving em damn em seen the papers saw some last night all this business about the third year and the big willie trying to keep their spirits up notice the way the boches try to make little of the push we've gained such a few miles they say pretty useful miles though to the top of the ridge oh besides it's not only the ground you know see what it really means they've taught their people the english couldn't really stand against em let alone advance how could we advance even one mile on selected ground they wanted so badly and get thousands of em prisoners and regular piles of em dead if we were so contemptible they'll find it hard to go on pumping in the same kind of tosh to any of their troops that have been in this show never get them to believe it any more no by jove they'll go on fighting of course they jolly well can't help that and their artillery and machine-guns will go on playing merry hell no doubt but i think the wind's up em i do really teddy i know it was at deville fairly up em one slipped away at about that stage and had a little talk with some of the kindly r a m c people with the result that the brothers did not go away by different trains but were booked for the same hospital which i hope they will very soon leave together for a few weeks of holiday recuperation in the south country rectory our army is full of lads like these and their quality is super excellent End of chapter ten chapter eleven of some battle stories by alec john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the australian as a fighter i think this must be my month for doing it sir august said a company sergeant major of the blank blank whom one found enjoying a cigarette in his cot on board one of the hospital ships at southampton the upper part of his face and head were all hidden in white bandages and he had had a machine-gun bullet through the upper part of his left leg but he was doing very nicely now thank you and in first-rate spirits both over the prospect of a few weeks holiday at home that is how he regards it and with regard to the outlook at the front when the war's over i shall have my hands full every august with celebrations i joined up on august fifteenth nineteen fourteen went to france on august second nineteen fifteen was knocked out near bazentin on august second nineteen sixteen and born on august third eighteen eighty four certainly must be my month for doing it sir mustn't it i think the boche will be a long time before he forgets august nineteen sixteen sir or july either don't think he likes our boys when they've got their tails fairly up the way they have now he's all right at a comfortable distance when he's got things his own way is master bosch but he don't like it a little bit when our chaps get right in among his lot the way they're doing now he don't like that sir not a little bit with rifles machine-guns heavies trench mortars rifle grenades men in werfers and all the like of that he's just as happy as the day is long he can go on at that game till the cows come home and i'm not saying but what he's mighty good at it he is you know sir and what with his fine dugouts and one thing with another he can stand a whole lot of it from us too and not be very much the worse for it but he do not like close quarters sir and he won't stick it that's the next thing i reckon if they could arrange for this war to be decided by one good fight between a boche battalion and a british in an open field with never a trench in it the war would be over in twenty minutes and there wouldn't be any more of that boche battalion left no not if it was the best they've got in their prussian guards the best of em can't stand up to our lads once they get down to real business alongside each other 
the trouble is to get near enough of course but we'll be there all right before long now sir if we can keep up the munition supply you see that chap down there in the cot next the ladder sir the one speaking to the sister now that's him he's an australian he is comes from a place in new south wales his battalion was in the thick of the posier show and they say he's going to be given a commission i don't know but i was talking last night to a chap in his platoon who was alongside him in the last fighting there and he told me there was one traverse that chap got into where the boches was too thick on the ground as you might say for him to work his bayonet they reckoned they'd got him of course going to eat him they was they got his rifle out of his hands such a jam he couldn't draw back for a thrust you see and they somehow got him down when his mate came round the corner of the traverse he says there were seven of the boches well what his mate saw was just the seven boches like in a football scrum swaying to and fro he couldn't see this chap at all he was underneath you see so this other chap he just gives one yell and starts in with his bayonet that made a bit of a breakaway as you might say and after that the fun began the chap who told me was a little bit of a fellow couldn't have been more'n five feet five another australian a lightweight he was he hung on to his bayonet and put in plenty footwork keepin clear you see and he says the way his mate the big chap in the cot there laid them boches out was the sight of a lifetime he just downed em with his hands and the chap told me that when he got a bosch down that bosch was done he wasn't taken any more anyway they took two of em prisoners and they couldn't take the other five because they was dead dead as mutton and the fellow told me that big chap did it all with his two hands he's cut about a bit you know and they laid his head open for him but one man against seven you know and them all armed it takes some doin the sister told me he'd be all right in a week they're hot stuff you know sir these australians once they get goin our boys the same they're happy when they get to close quarters and that's just what mr bosch can't stand at no price one of the things one notices about ninety per cent of our wounded is that to get the story of their own personal part in the fighting one has to go to someone else who was with them they are talkative enough about their mates but they are given to a modest and wholly lovable reticence regarding their own exploits this company sergeant major for instance who told me about the australian told me no word of the incident of which an officer of his company afterwards told me on the landing stage despite his head wounds and a bullet through his upper leg he had carried his wounded company commander from a bosch sap into our own line under a fire which would have made most wounded men think only of lying very low in any sort of cover they could get there was a private in our company said the lieutenant who told me of the sergeant major's brave act fellow named blank blank who earned the mention in dispatches i am sure he'll presently get if ever a man did one of these jolly larky little chaps he is always turning up at orderly room in the morning when we were training at home incorrigible chap for the very small misdemeanors you know but what a little brick when he's really up against it the NCOs of his platoon were knocked out to a man, just north of Bazentin la Petite, there. Fritz had a machine gun behind a knoll that simply kept us grilling. This little chap, blank, got the balance of the platoon together, fifteen or twenty of them, you know, and made a dash for the flank of that knoll. There were only five of them got there, I'm sorry to say, and by that time blank had three bullet wounds but when they got there they just wiped the earth with the boches at that gun smothered em and little blank turned the gun on the boche line and kept it clacking two or three hundred to the minute till i was able to get along there with number nine platoon and take over and he wouldn't have slacked off then in spite of his wounds if i hadn't made an order of it a great little fighter and a born leader mind you too there's lots of his sort on our side thank goodness end of chapter 11
Chapter Twelve of Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve News for the O. C. Company at Home. It would not be easy to find among the wounded as they arrive men who have recently had any experience of either leisure or comfort freedom to rest to chat to eat comfortable meals and smoke a pipe at ease to read a newspaper or to write a letter all these things have the charm of novelty and are enjoyed with the zest that belongs only to unaccustomed luxuries by our newly arrived wounded officers and men haven't been able to write a word except my signature on two or three field service postcards since the big push began one has heard that remark from a good many of the newcomers one morning a wounded officer had a rather longer wait between the time of his ship being berthed and his train pulling out than the average it's rather different from waiting in a trench he said i could stand a good deal of this as a matter of fact he put in most of the time in writing to his company commander who having been wounded at an early stage in the present offensive has lain since in a london hospital from that letter i am permitted to reproduce the following it's no good my attempting to give you any war news because there in london i've no doubt you get far more than we do and know more about it but as you've been away nearly a month now i thought you'd like a line or two about the company i don't suppose we've appeared in the leading articles yet have we not but what the men of your company deserve as much space there as any in the army i'm jolly sure of that we've lost nearly half our strength not killed i'm glad to say but wounded but the spirit of those that are left would do your heart good i want to tell you one thing particularly you heard about the way the battalion took and held that blank trench last week north of blank our company led as you probably know and though i says it as shouldn't since i had the honour of being in command the work they did was absolutely top hole they excelled themselves and i want to tell you why we got our orders the afternoon before about five and at half past six the c o paid us a visit and gave the company a little talk we were back in blank you know luxuriating in the old bosch trenches and dugouts which with a little repairing and scooping out have made a first-rate rest place well i wish i got a shorthand report of what the good old skipper said by gad you know it is marvellous the way he stood the strain of the last month at his age positively seems to thrive on it brave there isn't a boy in the battalion more absolutely indifferent to crumping than he is ah where was i anyhow it was all about you and between ourselves i don't mind confessing to you there was a certain amount of sniffling before he was through with it you remember those saturday morning talks of yours to the company in a's and b's dining-room at home we knew the c o looked in once or twice but i don't think any one knew just how much notice he used to take i tell you there wasn't much went on in the camp that he missed well he reminded the men of some of the things you used to tell them and talked about how we'd lived up to it so far in france and the responsibility that rested on us as first company in a regular battalion of a great regiment and all that you know paid what i think they call a graceful tribute to the service battalions too he did and then he wound up with a little about the job we were in for in the morning what an honour it was for the battalion to have been selected by the brigadier and what a double honour for a company to lead it and so on we were all rather worked up you know and then it was he wrung it in about you to top off with said how grieved you were to be out of it how he'd written to tell you that a was to do and how you'd be thinking about us in your bed there in london how we wished you could be there to lead us and how by god every man of us would go into that show to do you proud you know and more careful than if you really were watching us and all that i wish i could give you his words by jove i do but it was fine i can tell you that 
the c o himself was blowing his trumpet with the dirtiest old handkerchief you ever clapped eyes on the c s m nearly choked himself trying to stand fast at attention with a good chest on him and as for little sammy there isn't a better platoon commander in the battalion than little sammy is to-day he was fairly crumpled up had to edge round behind the c o to hide his bloomin emotions as they say oh it was what the men call a great do all right and seriously i'm awfully glad the old man did it you've heard how we got on of course c and d suffered pretty heavily i'm sorry to say worse than we did it was a complicated job we had to rush the trench first followed by b then we had to rush the support trench and keep bosh as busy as we could there while c and d cleaned up and consolidated the front line which was to be permanently held as it turned out the boches had considerable difficulty with their men the beggars simply wouldn't turn out of the dugouts to face us we found barely five and twenty men in the front line and those of course we absolutely smothered took em in our stride you know i got one myself with my trench dagger and the c s m who was next to me killed three to my certain knowledge i saw it well in next to no time we were in their support line with very few casualties sorry to say sergeant blank was killed between the two trenches and there we had some show i can tell you curious there should be so much difference between the spirit of the boches in two trenches next to one another in that second trench i won't say they fought like soldiers and men because honestly they didn't but they fought like mad beasts at least they fought hard i'll say that for em in the front line they funked it at first but their n c o s got them up to some purpose while c and d were cleaning up there and making good but in our line they fought hard from the word go and they fought like beasts i lost my own temper pretty badly and as you know i'm pretty easy going two of the swines found little jimmy you remember jimmy in number three lying beside a traverse wounded they both leaped at him seeing that he couldn't possibly defend himself and started slashing him through and through with their bayonets poor little chap that let me out and i tackled those two for you and myself together i was much too late to save jimmy but those two boches will never stir again there was a lot of that sort of thing as i say they fought like mad beasts not like soldiers i can't help thinking they must have had some drugs or something given em before we attacked i never saw such brutes and i never saw our chaps in finer form gad it would have done your heart good to see them your name was shouted half a dozen times we cleaned out every living thing before we finished and i really think we could have held that second line till morning but i had my orders and anyhow an orderly came along from the c o with a message that i was to retire to the front line and help c and d consolidate there were still a few boches coming up from deep dugouts there and i think c and d were rather glad of our help in the clearing up the boche countered five separate times and each time we let him get pretty close and fairly mowed him down with lewis's and bombs no exaggeration they were thick on the ground like mown corn we were specially glad of the way the show went partly because the boches had been such unutterable beasts there and partly too because i'm certain every man of ours strained an extra pound or two on the strength of what the c o had said about you overnight End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen stick fast and his officer a r a m c officer on board one of the hospital ships at southampton put me into touch with three of its passengers whom one would have been sorry to miss they lay in different parts of the ship 
all were weakened by loss of blood and considerably knocked about all were smoking cigarettes when i saw them and neither could have been in higher spirits if they had been twelve-year-old schoolboys arriving home for the summer holidays the senior is one of the oldest privates in our new armies the junior is one of our youngest officers for he celebrated his nineteenth birthday in a front-line trench in france last june his friends may be fairly proud of him for though only in his twentieth year he has already proved himself a brave officer and a gallant gentleman when the war began this officer had just left school within the week of the declaration and a few weeks later he was to have entered a merchant's counting-house in a busy northern city as things are his experiences have been quite other than clerical for nine months he has been a platoon commander in the fighting line in france he was wounded once before early this year but so slightly that a week out of the line in a field ambulance put him right again now he will enjoy a somewhat longer rest but he reckons on being back in the line in a month don't want to miss all the fun you know and a surgeon told me he will probably have his wish he told some stirring things about the conduct of his men in the fighting round Longueval. But what one wants to tell here is something about his own conduct, as one learned of it from the man most intimately concerned, and an eye-witness who was that man's section commander. It was guesswork to call Private Blank of the Blank Blank one of the oldest men in the new armies, for one did not ask his age but his hair or what little one could see of it under his bandages is white and his weak old beard and grizzled moustache and appearance generally are those of a man well past middle age i'd wager he committed a gallant perjury when he enlisted and that he will get a decoration for it in heaven well it wasn't not what you'd call a regular attack sir it was more of a raid like that our company was in that night up to the left of long valley it were we was on the right bein in number three platoon sir that's mr blank's platoon you know sir we wasn't to take their line you understand sir but just to stir the boches up a bit as you might say and find out what they was a doin of and put a stop to it which i think we put a stopper on it all right sir so far as them particular boches is concerned our artillery gave em taffy afore we started sir toppin off with five minutes hurricane fire when you couldn't hardly hear yourself shout and then over we went sir my mr blank a leadin and a proper young gentleman he is too sir as fine a officer as we've got i reckon for he never fails his men he don't he never forgets em and the best of everything that's goin he gets for em and i don't see how a officer can do more'n that whoever he be i got a bullet through me left arm while we was a-crossin and that made me a bit awkward like with me bayonet but i got me bosh all right sir when we got to the trench i did that and i stuck him twice it i think for i wanted to be sure of him and just when i was a drawin me bayonet back the second time and wonderin if i'd had any more luck a big bosh sergeant came at me i saw the stripes of him sir and afore i could get me bayonet back for a thrust he caught me over the head with the spiked club he carried i saw the club ay i saw it a-comin for me head somehow i knew i couldn't stop it couldn't get the bayonet that high up quick enough you see so i thought let be then we'll go together and so i let drive with me bayonet for a stomach and that's all i knew about it at this point one had to turn to the next cot but two where the grizzled warrior's section commander lay with a broken ankle a fair red-haired blue-eyed giant of about three or four and twenty before he would tell me anything else the section commander had to put one hand to his mouth whilst i bent down low towards him by order to receive in my ear in a hoarse whisper the following piece of information you might think him queer but a gamer old blighter never wore out shoe-leather if you can follow me sir 
the jerks of the section commander's head his ponderous winks violently twisted mouth and gesticulating right thumb were upon the whole sufficient to the entire ward one would have thought to indicate that he referred to my grizzled friend a transparent person the section commander heaven send him sound ankles and good luck wherever he may go the elaborately set forth unconsciousness of his look across at the grizzled one after his hoarse whisper to me was a thing beautiful to see as i was saying sir he began well knowing he had said nothing of the sort as yet we made what you might call a nice clean job of that bit of trench and the dugouts remarkable clean job of the dugouts sir with mills and grenades and plenty of em and after the and grenades three men with a bayonet in each sir so's to leave all tidy great one for tidying up sir is our officer and then he blew his whistle three times sir did mr blank that was the signal to retire and we all climbed out beside him just as he'd told us hand and knees outside mr blank came out last and when we'd gone it might be ten paces sir hello says mr blank where's old stick fast and he says by which he meant to refer sir to his nibs here not meanin any harm to the old boy sir not at all but we call him stick fast because he never was known to fall out or go sick or give up next thing i knew mr blank was runnin as you might say hell for leather if you can foller me sir for that bosh trench yellin stick fast loud enough to startle the kaiser but just before he started he'd said you get on back to our lines lads take em back sergeant he said to sergeant blank orders says the sergeant sort of grumpy like you could see he didn't like it but off he goes with the platoon well i stooped down to do up me bootlace you see sir and i grabbed two men of my section and told em told em to do up theirs you see sir and when we got back into the trench we was only a yard or two behind mr blank hello corporal says he friendly like like that sir what the hell are you doin here he says just like that so of course i told him the sergeant sent us back to lend him a hand and just then old stickfast there did a bit of a groan and a bunch of boches come round the edge of the traverse feelin their way with bayonets well out thinkin we'd all gone then mr blank he lets out a yell you could hear a mile off let em have it boys bomb em out give em hell all the lot of you says he just as if he'd got a company behind him i had one bomb left bechance and gave it em over the traverse perlitely as i could and mr boches bolted like rabbits couldn't see their tails for smoke old stickfast couldn't let go his rifle so we had to yank it out of the big bosh he had skewered in the belly and then we lugged him out of the trench mr blank has got the bosh's knockberry a beauty with spikes an inch long on it goin back with stickfast i got a bullet through me ankle and mr blank he got another in the shoulder and stickfast he got one in his left hand but otherwise we was all serene and i got in on me hands and knees with two bosh helmets so we didn't do so bad but we reckon mr blank would a gone back after stickfast by himself if he'd had to walk to berlin for the old man the temporary officer is apt to be quite permanently a man and the men he leads will follow his like while breath is in them End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen of Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen A Cool Canadian. Their rollicking high spirits is certainly the thing that impresses one first and most about our wounded officers and men as they arrive. But there are other impressions one notes a striking prevalence of true modesty and upon investigation one often finds a deal of shrewd direct thoughtfulness the second in command of a battalion which has been doing some hard and bloody fighting on the immediate flank of our allies down guimont way was among the cot cases one talked with 
he had been rather badly knocked about by a german bomb at close quarters but he allowed me to light a cigarette for him and obviously enjoyed smoking it while we chatted efficiency organization thoroughness jolly good things in their place you know he said the germans have them splendidly developed and in the past perhaps we've been a bit lacking in this direction but my own impression is that the folk who talk about the huns having gone mad being the mad dogs of europe they're not really exaggerating so much as you might suppose i believe a tremendous number of boches are to all intents and purposes mad tell you why their worship of efficiency and thoroughness machine organization has carried them so far that they have entirely lost all sense of humour now when a man really loses all vestige of the sense of humour i tell you he's too nearly mad to be good company it really is so complete absence of the sense of humour is in effect madness or leads to it anyhow and that's what the matter is with the bosch to-day when the hun was practically having things his own way a year ago you know the news he gave the world was quite intelligible and a good deal of it was to be relied on he lies like the devil now in all his news well that's all right one can easily see why but if you read his lies carefully i've been reading em all the way between amiens and here you'll find they're the lies of a madman they are quite mad lies he says our offensive has been smashed that we have given it up having accomplished nothing at all that we have failed to injure him in the least have gained nothing and are so appalled by the terrible casualties he has inflicted on us that we have finally given up in despair well really you know well i ask you do we look like it perhaps you'll say you can't judge well you ask any man you like who comes from the front i don't care how hard he's hit he can't help knowing the preposterous absurdity of that sort of guff everybody on our side knows we hold the initiative and dictate every move on the west front every move must be costly because it's all over ground fortified and prepared for a couple of years an unending chain of fortresses really but we keep going forward we never go back and every hour day and night we are inflicting more casualties than we suffer thank goodness at our worst we never showed much sign of losing our sense of humour i've been studying the boche in the field for over a year and i'm convinced he's lost his entirely and that this is a worse loss than anything in ground or munitions indeed i think it's fatal his monstrous war machine is still immensely strong and will go on working and destroying for a long time yet but his individual fighters they are either drug and machine driven maniacs foaming and fighting as mad dogs fight or in other places they are broken and despairing wretches who in the absence of blows and pricks from their herdsmen beg for mercy and capture they've no sane medium left our chaps are all sane medium cheery game fighters with an active sense of humour which would redeem the worst sort of shambles to the last gasp our chaps remain human so do the french the allies will win if only because of that they remain human men and good fellows no matter how much horror the mad dogs put up mad dogs is not too strong believe me i've seen em spitting and biting i know by god i do a canadian captain with his left arm slung and a german officer's helmet in his haversack said oh i'm a fraud oughtn't to be here at all there's nothing the matter with me but a bullet through my arm and anyhow logically i suppose i ought to be dead or a prisoner with the huns we took a trench northwest of blank you know and our chaps hurried on to the second line without orders no doubt they thought they'd cleared the front line 
i tried hard to get out after them but it was an awkward place with a high shaling bit of parados and you'd hardly believe how important your left arm is till you try a job like that without it my elbow was broken you see my orderly was with me he would got pipped through the shoulder outside the trench while i squatted there i heard a scuffling underground just round the other side of the traverse i was leaning on took a look round the other side and found a boche officer the first i'd seen just appearing at the mouth of a dugout feeling his way out i could see the spikes of helmets behind him so there it was my revolver was empty my orderly had lost his rifle away outside the trench awkward wasn't it well of course i pointed my revolver at the boche officer one does that instinctively i suppose and to my surprise he said in english don't shoot i said i'd shoot the lot of em if one of em moved you sit perfectly still sit right down where you are mr bosch and i'll take you to england but if you move you'll get six service bullets and my men will come along and bury you in your dugout they sat down like lambs i managed to whisper to my orderly round the edge of the traverse to get forward somehow and bring some men and first of all to find me a rifle and bayonet or a bomb or a toothpick or some blessed thing better than an empty revolver now do be careful mr bosch i said to the officer i'm a conscientious objector when i'm at home and i hate killing like the devil i don't know for the life of me what made me tell him that but i shall be bound to give you six bullets if you budge one inch and they're clumsy brutes these service bullets they make a devil of a hole at close quarters worse than two or three rifle bullets we're not moving said the boche he seemed a bit sulky i thought so we sat and waited my orderly had gone and nothing seemed to happen i felt for my pipe with my left hand but it was no go that arm was out of business got anything to smoke i said to the boche and as he moved i saw the risk and told him pretty sharply to put down the rifle he carried over this way please gently now along the ground careful i told him and so i got a first-rate weapon seems incredible i shouldn't have thought of that before doesn't it that's why i say i ought logically to be dead well after that we got on famously he found a cigar and gave it me but i had to pretend i didn't like cigars because with only one hand in working order i didn't dare to risk lighting it but that bosch officer remained curiously sulky i thought i tried him on half a dozen subjects and i know he could speak english as well as i could but i couldn't get much out of him except that he didn't like our artillery at all and that he supposed we must be near the end of our ammunition oh and he said that now the zepps had complete command of the air all over england life must be pretty beastly for us there i told him i thought they had managed to kill a few dogs and cats a horse or two and so on but that the only thing that worried our folk was that so few people had been able to see a zepp and they were all very curious to have a look at one he didn't seem to like that after a long time my orderly got back with three men and a corporal and then i ordered the boches to march out without their weapons there were twenty-two of em altogether i thought my empty revolver was rather a good joke so i told the boche officer about it then but he only scowled and growled and after that he was sulkier than ever so we had no more talk End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of some battle stories by alec john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the hospital mail bags a medical officer whose duties take him to many of our military hospitals has been good enough to obtain and lend extracts from a number of letters received by wounded officers and men from comrades in other hospitals all over the world the men and women of our race and our brave allies are thinking talking and writing of the great offensive north of the somme which began on july first 
histories are already in the making no doubt but one doubts if any of them will contain more direct human interest than could be found just now in the mail-bags of our military hospitals dotted over the face of britain from edinburgh to torquay our wounded soldiers are enjoying an amount of leisure and rest which is of course entirely out of the reach of any one serving at the front and here in our own country a certain freedom in writing which can never exist in the neighbourhood of the enemy is permissible one finds in our hospitals and convalescent homes officers and men who were in close contact with the enemy three days ago and others again who have not seen the trenches for three weeks for three months and even here and there those who left the front as long ago as the beginning of the present year and among these patients with all their differing stages of freshness from the fighting line there are of course family ties in the military sense as well as the civilian sense the military family is the division its branches are the brigades its households are the battalions a who counts the time he has been in blighty by weeks or months gives home news in the civilian sense to b who as yet can only count his time in england by days and b fresh from his unit in france gives home news in the military sense to a thus a lieutenant in a scottish hospital who arrived home wounded a few days after the present great offensive began writing to a senior officer of his unit in a london hospital newly arrived there from the neighbourhood of highwood after thanking his senior for news of the battalion says some of the things at home will puzzle you at first having time to read the newspapers right through makes a difference i was awfully puzzled at first to find they still have tribunals and exemptions and things and people grousing about the docking of holidays and weekends and the terrible hardships of being taken away from their business for military service and so on but these things are only surface incidents really and don't mean much though they make a good deal of noise the country's perfectly sound at heart i think and i am told the munition workers really are playing up like sports one's got to remember you know that in spite of all that's happened our folk at home here have not seen war the way the people have in france it makes all the difference also the whole idea of citizen military service is strange and new to them as touching themselves they hear of married men of forty being called up for training and they seem to think it's an unheard-of kind of heroism or martyrdom or something dear souls they're so extraordinarily sentimental as you know in our battalion over sixty per cent of the men were married and all enlisted before november nineteen fourteen the proportion of over forty was very considerable although the age limit then was what was it something in the thirties i know they gave up their jobs and left their wives and families to lie about their age bless em and to train with us without being told to by any one and nobody thought to call em heroes or martyrs and i'm sure it never struck them that way though they've been living in the trenches just on a year and the new lot that get so much sympathy have been raking in the shackles at higher rates of pay than they ever had in their lives during twenty months of war and enjoying all home comforts queer isn't it and to think of men a month or two over the age being keen to take advantage of the calendar now and other chaps prating to the tribunals about their consciences and their businesses and things mostly businesses i think now after two years and at the height of the somme push but the country as a whole is sound and quite unalterably determined and i think we can rely on it there'll be no slackening in the munitions output and if i'm right there the boche's number is up and nothing in the wide world can save him a sergeant in the south coast writing to his platoon commander in manchester it is three days now since i landed sir and i was very glad to have your letter this morning you really must not worry about the platoon sir 
they would be very much upset if they knew you were worrying about them because they would think you could not trust them and you know sir they are worth trusting i left lance sergeant blank in charge he's come on wonderfully and i asked captain c if he would recommend him for full sergeant he's worth it the doctor here promises me that i can be out of hospital in a week or two so i may get back before you and in any case the platoon will do nothing to disgrace you sir you can rely on that in the push-up north of Poissiers, we had the right flank of the company and the captain said we did splendidly we had nine casualties and i'm quite sure we got three times that number of boches besides eleven prisoners we took after we'd got their front trench corporal s and three men of his section went out on their own the moon was clouded then and got a boche machine-gun from their second line and brought it back with three helmets the corporal was slightly wounded and the others not touched the c o was told about it they all want you back sir but the platoon's doing fine and you must not worry about them i think we've got the boche fairly moving this time he won't hold threepful much longer private blank in colchester to private blank in london i saw t d to-day and he told me you were in london how goes it old sport i got a bit of shrap in my shoulder but nothing to worry about we had a great do outside longy valley after you left you remember that ridge on the right past where the reaper lay we had master bosch on toast there he came on at us in great blobs like those stunts we did at codford we held our fire and then let him have it at close range four lewis guns and our own rapid hard as we could lick my rifle burned my hand you never saw anything like it the way those huns went down seemed a shame to take the money and then all of a sudden cease fire and the captain yells out adam boys finish the blighters he says and over we went it was a proper circus we thought it was to be just a defence and instead we took their bloomin trench and fairly put the wind up the lot of em you never saw the like half of em was bayoneted climbing over their own parados fairly spiked to it and the rest of em was prisoners fair screaming for mercy they was we held that trench for over an hour and bombed right along their communications and blew in their dugouts and two machine-gun emplacements and while we were doing it b company was cutting a sap out from our own front line so's we'd had cover most of the way back a great do from a subaltern in glasgow to a subaltern in london i've just heard i've got my second star so you'll have to be a bit more respectful in future my son three weeks in command of the company you know with only one star what a hero mind you they did play up well i'll never forget it there wasn't a man in the company but was trying to help me all the time and as for the old c s m bless his geordie heart i'd like to put up a statue to him for three days before he was killed i don't believe he was ever off his feet and mind you we were hard strafing most of the time he did a bit of everything the s m from bombing and machine-gunning to burying huns to get em out of our road i got a couple of helmets but i gave one to blank because it was given me the one i've kept i took on my own from the beggar who got his bayonet through my arm i'll never go without a rifle and bayonet again had to tackle the beggar with my hands but i finished him with my revolver and after that i carried his rifle you bet and hung his pickle tub or whatever you call em on my belt there's a lot of fight left in em of course but we've got em cold this time i'm certain of it the prisoners we take are jolly glad to get out of it people say human nature's the same everywhere well it isn't you take it from me these blooming huns are not the same stuff as our men our chaps mostly want to go straight they're all decent at heart bosch wants to go crooked and begad he does End of chapter fifteen
Chapter Sixteen of Some Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen: The Difference. As a listener only, I participated in a rather interesting meeting on the deck of a hospital ship just berthed at Southampton captain j who was invalided home from the western front in the spring of this year was outward bound for the same sector of our front and was given permission to board the hospital ship to see lieutenant r a relative serving in the same unit and homeward bound now as the result of a wound received forty-eight hours earlier in the fighting northwest of Pozieres. salutations and first inquiries ended the captain said well it seems i've missed the best of the fun i strafed like blazes to get out in the beginning of july but couldn't bring it off and now according to the newspapers we're getting back to sort of pre-push conditions who says so oh some correspondent or other well i'll bet he hasn't been in the trenches much if he says that there's nothing the same as it was even in june let alone when you were there but what's the difference oh every mortal thing is different it all feels different but how every way for instance there was nothing but bare mud all around our trenches when you left and long before the push there was green stuff growing round everywhere creepers and things straggling over the sides of the trenches weeds sprouting everywhere and that's been altered again since the push everything being ploughed in as you might say by the artillery yes i suppose the heavy stuff has chewed it up a bit but we saw plenty of that before i left you remember how the boche mortars and oil cans smothered us the week before i left below la boiselle oh that my dear chap that was a rest cure we used to notice a shell hole then what you notice now is a place where there's no shell hole and you don't often find it and anyhow of course all the trenches you knew are away behind us now one goes overland all round there even north of that's the same lancaster avenue rivington john o gaunt coniston right along by chorley checker bent lime street liverpool avenue all those streets we worked in before you left god the water and the mud there was there well they'll never be used as trenches again you know all overland there now stray bullets of course but just as safe as the villages we used to billet in ah oh, yes of course you're further forward but when one gets there i suppose it's much the same as the old places used to be not the least bit it's all totally different you see we don't go into trenches now to hold a bit of line as it used to be we're on the move now you see oh no we've done with that rotten old grind of everlastingly going back to the same old quagmires then you know we're on the high ground now that makes an enormous difference you can see the promised land as tommy says see it all the time and we're nibbling chunks out of it all the time oh the chap who says it's as it was doesn't know what he's talking about nobody feels a bit the same i can tell you why our artillery's working now in places where the boches artillery used to be away ahead of their old front you know what used to be behind it the main thing about the ground one used to look out over was its emptiness remember how desolate it used to look dead and empty like those wells stories before the earth had any people on it begad it isn't empty now we clear it up behind us of course the salvage chaps see to that hundreds of tons of bosch rifles equipment and so on and out in front you get the same mess but different when the breeze is from that way because of the number of dead boches you know lots of the ground we take is full of dead boches before ever we get near it dugouts full trenches full shell holes full dead boches everywhere dead rats too by the thousand and yet the boches do their best to get in their own dead they're pretty good at it like everything else they do matter of policy you know the sight of so many dead is as discouraging to their troops as the stink of em is sickening to us 
oh i can't tell you what the difference is but you can take it from me there's nothing the same as it was nothing at all you've only got to look at our men to know the difference they well they've become veterans you know real old warriors before we went plodding along pegging away you know because one had to do one's job but now now we're winning the war we're getting ahead everybody knows it i can't explain the thing but you'll see what i mean directly you get out we get held up here and there we shall go on getting held up of course but there's no deadlock you know we're getting on with it all the time and the boche is getting smashed up oh it's different all right looked at on paper there is something curiously dumb and inarticulate about it all but i could see the captain felt as i did that it certainly was different if the lieutenant could not explain very well he was able to transmit his own conviction a letter reached me from a wounded officer who landed here recently and was sent to a london hospital he had been asked to let one know what impressed him most about the revolutionary change he passed through from the fighting line northeast of bazenton la petit to his present resting place in one of the surgical wards of a military hospital in london but the first thing is the bed you know clean sheets and absolutely unlimited sleep at first i had a dozen or more sleeps in the day as well as the solid night slabs of it even now i'm hogging it a bit in that respect it is an absolutely glorious thing to feel the clean sheets all around you and know you can sleep as much as ever you like then the baths to wash as much as ever you like i tell you you've got to go seven days and nights without ever taking your boots off or seeing soap or a towel to know what this luxury means it's priceless and then the grub it seems i'm a pretty fleshly sort of a chap eh well it's true anyhow i still find it a great joy to see a tray with a snowy cloth and shining things put down on my bed-table it sounds piggish but the eating of the nice clean food is a tremendous joy just sitting there eating with a book beside the tray too and to feel you haven't got to hurry or watch out or listen or arrange for any blessed thing at all sometimes i just sniff the sweet clean air and enjoy that i just lie and let my eyes drift up and down the ward hearing nothing looking at nothing enjoying everything it's peace i never knew what the word meant before nobody can who hasn't lived in the firing line i've made up my mind what it is that sort of heals and recharges one more than anything else it's being not responsible for anything or anybody it's great. End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of some battle stories by Alec john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen what every m o knows the public probably realize now a good deal more than they did before the present allied offensive north of the somme as to the terribly far-reaching character of the destruction wrought by the kind of fighting that is waged on the western front the wars of the past have been child's play by comparison with this kind of fighting one has grown accustomed to finding among the wounded a few men who have been struck down without ever being near the firing line transport men quartermaster sergeants orderlies in villages behind the lines and all sorts of people whose work keeps them well in rear of the fighting lines have seen their share of death and destruction in this war even before the present offensive and in parts of the line which were called quiet death came flying through the air from time to time to scatter devastation in all kinds of unexpected places 
during the last few months our artillery has been making life extraordinarily difficult for the enemy even in places situated two and three hours march behind his fighting lines in this work one gathers from all new arrivals from the front our gunners have established a very marked superiority over the boche wounded airmen have told one that for every shell which has exploded during the past month in villages and rest places behind our front fifty of our shells have landed with deadly effect among the huns lines of communication the fact remains however that even on our side the risks of shot and shell are by no means confined in this war to the combatants many of our stretcher-bearers take almost as much risk as the average private of the line and our medical officers often carry on their labours in circumstances of the most deadly exposure i was talking with a newly landed r a m c officer who had carried on his work of tending and dressing wounded men for several hours after being badly mauled himself by shrapnel splinters his point of view was different of course from that of the fighting man but not less interesting and valuable one thought in a war like this you know he said one comes across all sorts of bravery quite outside killing and being killed perhaps the public hardly realizes yet what a lot there is in soldiers lives outside fighting i sometimes think the actual fighting is among the least severe of the strains placed upon the soldier the recent fighting has been on such an epic scale such a huge and devastating business what's the word i saw in the papers this morning uh, grandiose yes that's it that i suppose it's natural the stay-at-home public should be apt to forget the merely human aspect but it's there just the same our chaps remain just as human as ever in their rough kindliness one to another and don't forget in the different illnesses and disabilities to which humans are subject fighting makes plenty of demands for two o'clock in the morning courage of course but so do other things in this life at the front i assure you and whereas the public hears something about the fighting heroism it knows very little about the other kinds oh well they are all fighting courage of a kind of course what i mean is this toothache neuralgia dyspepsia colic stomach cramps sick headaches sore throats whitlows and homely little things of that sort are not washed out by terrific bombardments and epoch-making advances not a bit of it the world's greatest philosophers have often admitted that neither their philosophy nor any one else's was proof against a stomach-ache or the torments of an exposed nerve and a hollow tooth regimental officers will tell you that it takes a pretty full man's share of pluck and endurance even when one is very fit to stick it cheerfully in some of the phases of an offensive like this well i'd like the public to bear in mind what is known to every medical officer in the army that in every single unit in the front there are officers and men who are sticking it hour after hour and day after day with never an interval of rest or comfort or anything to ease them when if they were at home no matter how urgent or important their business they would be in bed or at least receiving such ease and comfort such relief from pain as medical attention can provide in civil life i'd like every one who is doing his bit at home every man and every woman to remember this these brave fellows of ours they don't go sick you know during an offensive it's as much as one can do to get some of them out of the fighting line even when they are quite badly wounded and as for the wounds of sickness sometimes infinitely more exhausting and trying to bear well they just set their teeth and say nothing about these in the last weeks i assure you i have been quite glad to see coming my way with wounds so that i could get them the rest and medical attention they needed 
soldiers from colonels to privates who to my certain knowledge must have been suffering horribly for days and in some cases for weeks without the slightest kind of alleviation of any sort whilst keeping a stiff upper lip and carrying on with never a spoken word that wasn't cheery in all the din and fury of the front line men with acute internal troubles racking neuralgia or violently painful things like whitlow's living on biscuits and bully beef in shell-pounded sun-baked chalk ditches for a week or so on end half blind for lack of sleep the very last man i dressed had a slight wound in the left hand you might fix this up as soon as you can will you doc he said cheerily to explain why he did not want to wait his turn i must get back to my platoon as quick as i can we've got a little raid on this evening a moment later he was vomiting well i won't bother you with detail but his case was perfectly clear in ordinary life he'd have been in bed and probably operated on weeks before i knew beyond any possibility of doubt the sort of torment he must have been suffering for weeks and the exact reasons why he looked such a scarecrow i fixed him i was his senior in rank and when he tried to get away i placed him under arrest begad i did at the clearing station later on i found out from his company commander who was wounded that though every one could see he was pretty ill this lieutenant had never said one word about his condition or allowed any one else to talk about it he had just gone on with his job day and night about the best officer i've got too said his company commander couldn't eat himself but he never missed seeing the last handful of his platoons rationed properly dished out oh he mothered em well to a medical man some of these cases are wonderful we know precisely what they mean it's the kind of heroism that doesn't win decorations but it's the real article all right i can assure you and this new army of ours is full of it i'd like the people at home to understand something about it it should make it easier for them to stick their bit without bothering too much about missed holidays and things this medical officer had nothing to say about the quiet heroism of many of his comrades of the r a m c one has to look elsewhere for appreciations of that very real bravery End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen the south african among all the laughing smoking chatting cheery thousands of wounded men one has seen land in england from the front i have met one who was sad this was a south african company commander who landed with shrapnel wounds in hip and ankle it required some perseverance on my part to obtain any information at all from captain t but the striking difference between his mood and that of all those round him impressed me and i am glad i did eventually fathom the reasons of it apart from their general human interest they throw a notable light on the relations existing between the officers and other ranks in our south african units the sector of new line that captain t s company held northeast of blank was most furiously counter-attacked by the huns after an intense bombardment the third and fourth and fifth waves of the attack were broken by the company's trench fire which included lewis guns handled to the best possible advantage but still the boches came streaming on and accordingly the company rose out of their shallow trench and rushed forward a bit to welcome the invader having learned on more than one occasion during the preceding week just how little the hun likes the steel in that advance captain t was struck down as he lay helpless on the ground he saw plainly that the enemy's charge was broken and he ordered his company back to their trench to save casualties 
he yelled to his men to get back and he sent a young lance corporal who had only earned his stripe during that same week to ram the order home so the defenders began to stream back unevenly as the word reached them just then captain Blank saw two things he saw four straggling boches approaching him where he lay and he saw the young lance corporal whose rifle had been smashed earlier on deliberately returning to him from the direction of the trench the boches had doubtless recognized his uniform and were anxious to kill or capture a captain the young lance corporal was coming on slowly and steadily like a man drawn irresistibly by some kind of fascination get back to the trench man get back shouted the captain one of the boches dropped on his knee to fire the lance corporal came steadily on go back shouted the captain as sternly as he could do you hear me corporal that's an order go back or i'll put you under arrest damn you go back the kneeling Bosch fired twice and missed. The Lance Corporal, no more than a boy in years, looked back and forward. He had his orders, and was a well-disciplined good lad. It was as though the sharp order had placed weights about his feet. So he swayed. Then he gave one look at his captain. You know the way your favorite dog looks at you if you order him back home, when perhaps you've a gun under your arm? and in defiance of the discipline which made an order tug at his feet the boy strode on again towards his captain glancing from the boches to his officer as though measuring his chances the captain managed to level his revolver it was worth a bluff to try and get the fellow back by god corporal i'll put a bullet through you if you don't go back and at that the lance corporal broke into a run but towards the fallen officer not the trench he fell with a bullet through his heart within three paces of his captain two boches were on their knees firing at him then the other two were advancing crouchingly on the captain the captain had not yet used a round from his revolver so he turned that now on the advancing boches but at that moment a lewis gun in our own trench firing pretty high opened on that bit of no man's land the incident had been seen evidently the fire was too high to hurt any one really but the gunners feared to hit their own officer but the boches did not understand that their own gunners are a good deal less particular so they turned tail and ran hard for their own trenches while the captain having emptied his revolver at them lost consciousness and knew nothing more of the business till he found himself in our own trench dressing station and now captain Blank finds it sadly hard to forget the solemn puzzled face of the young lance corporal who so deliberately elected to give up his life for his officer but i told the captain he must be very proud of that young lance corporal not sad about him there have been many such noble deaths among the men of the new army and the bulk of them are in no way recorded by mortal scribes in other days when our fighting has been always on a much smaller less intense scale it was possible to record a larger proportion of the heroic deeds done but as a r a m c officer with whom i talked of this particular incident after the wounded captain's train had started on its northern journey said i think it's up to us as a nation to take care that none of these sacrifices is wasted three parts of them will have no other record but if the people choose they can make the nation's future the best possible sort of record and the best sort of tribute and acknowledgment too all the nation has to do is to carry on right through in the same spirit that these chaps gave up their lives end of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of Psalm Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen 
it's a great do high spirits would seem to be the rule among all who land in blighty from out hospital ships at least i have come upon only one exception to this rule but in my recollection high water mark was reached by a certain laughing crew of bandaged merrymakers who arrived on a sunday monday morning at the end of summer the word merrymakers seems extraordinarily out of place in this connection but what would you they were all laughing and talking nineteen to the dozen true all were bandaged the clothes of most were torn and bloody many were unable to move from their cots but all were laughing and talking with boisterous jocularity and smoking cigarettes and generally comporting themselves like exceptionally cheery and high-spirited holiday-makers on a pleasure excursion here in england we discuss and speculate upon the fluctuations of the world's greatest war upon all its various fronts the british soldier even when at his weakest from loss of blood and a long journey in hot weather exults in the sure and certain confidence of victory of steady progress toward glorious and final success he has only seen his own little bit of course but he is magnificently happy about what he has seen there's nothing on earth can stop us now so long as the munitions keep going at full pressure said a young captain who knows that he has to lose his right foot and is less cast down about it than the average civilian is over the prospect of losing a worn-out tooth i have heard almost the same words continuously the same emphatic conviction from many scores of wounded men there was one particular party of private soldiers with a lance corporal and a couple of corporals among them which as a specimen group of our magnificent new army men and as an illustration of the inimitable spirit that animates them will remain always in one's memory they were gathered together in the shade of a projecting portion of a boat deck all walking cases mostly bandaged for more than one wound all ragged and blood-stained as to their uniforms bronzed and weather-worn as to their hands and faces with the indescribable fighting line look in their eyes full of laughter and good cheer and carrying among them a wheelbarrow load of souvenirs in the shape of bosch helmets clubs daggers and the like one half of the party i should say were from the neighbourhood of pozieres and the rest from the extreme right of our line where we join hands with our gallant allies round and about guimont some of these last were no more than twenty-four hours from the actual firing line all were glad to talk it's a great do sure enough and if fritz has to put in another winter in the trenches he'll be a mighty sick man before it's over i don't see how he's going to stick it come to that how does he stick it now tain't because he likes it what else can he do you saw the machine-gun chains he's driven to his job like a beast is the boche oh, that's so i'd be sorry for the beggar if he didn't play so many dirty tricks not me mate i'll never be sorry for the boche seen too much of the blighter if you'd seen the way he killed my officer you wouldn't waste no bloomin sorrow on him them as i've seen is as full of dirty tricks as a cartload of monkeys or else they're foamin at the mouth like mad dogs a boche is no good till he's dead i say we've been too soft with em what was it about your officer then mickey mr blank as fine a lad he was as ever you saw on parade and he knew how to take care of his platoon too i can tell you we was in their front line then clear in the trench we took a whole lot of the beggars prisoners and mr blank he'd never let you lay a finger on a bosch if the fellow made a sign of putting up his hands although he'd seen something of their dirty tricks too no by god he said not in my platoon mickey it's a point of honour mickey he says much they care for honour the cruel beasts they are we come to a dugout that had the entrance to it half blown in and i was all for bombing it first and askin questions after but my officer he wouldn't have it he kept in front with me and the rest and number one section behind him Voista, 
he sings out down the dugout in their own lingo you see and one of the sausage eaters he calls out all so meek and perlite in english you know only me sir he says well come on out and nobody'll hurt you says mr blank cannot move sir very bad wound sir says the bosch damn him well i wanted to go and see to the blighter but mr blank saw the bomb in me hand and didn't altogether trust me maybe wait a minute mickey says he and down he goes next minute i hear a groan and they've struck me mickey very faint like from mr blank here my god boys i says to the section the blank swine has killed mr blank well we just made one rush for that dugout one of em stuck me with his bayonet here you see at the end of the passage he'll do no more stickin i smashed his head with me butt and i got one other with me bayonet and i could hear others runnin like rabbits in the passages i got one of ours to look after mr blank though i could see he was done and i sent the others back to the trench quick to see if they could catch any of the boches getting out another way then one other chap and me we followed on where we heard em runnin and i don't mind tellin you what was seein poor young mr blank and the sting of that bosch bayonet in me side i was seein pretty red there was two of the devils i'd got in the dugout and there were five more altogether one a sergeant there was two of my chaps waitin for em when they got to the other entrance in the trench and my mate and me we come along pretty close behind em they squealed all right when they saw the point of tim's bayonet in the sun just at the mouth of the dugout where they thought they was going to get clear they turned and come our way then with tim and his mate behind em and then they met me and my mate and uh, well they won't meet nobody else this side of hell we fought like rats in that hole and poor tim he was killed i got chipped about a bit myself but i was that wild about my officer they hadn't got much of a chance the dirty hounds ay twere a pity they got tim and the officer a pity that the speaker was a very big man with a rough-hewn granite-like face a farm worker i would say by no means sad or gloomy but of a reflective turn his hands were enormous and another man told me he had done great execution with them at close quarters i could well believe it he ruminated now apparently with great satisfaction there's nothing very civilized about em even when they've lived in england if england's got any sense there won't be any more of em live here yet a while tom's goin to stand for parliament when the war's over i could teach him a bit about boches if i did well see you raise the bacon ration for us tom and you'll mention that little matter of the strawberry jam won't you end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of some battle stories by ellick john dawson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty on the way to london for the time i was leaving behind me the long trimly kept landing stage at southampton with its acres of clean garnished sheds in which the wounded lie in serried ranks quietly awaiting the different trains i was travelling with some of them in one of the smoothly run hospital trains bound for london from engine to guard's van the interior of the long train was immaculate spotless a triumph of scientific organization of carefully thought out most admirably and consistently administered system the accommodation was simply the very best neither more nor less that modern ingenuity can provide for the easy transport of the sick and wounded for the general officer and for the private it was all precisely alike not by reason of haste or emergency or accident but because nothing better can be designed and the authorities hold that the best cannot be too good for the soldier of whatever rank who is struck down in the performance of his duty in the war which for us means the defence of civilization against the onslaught of the modern hun the mad dog of europe 
the train slowed down to a momentary stop half in and half out of the station at historic winchester a fast train from town had just previously passed through bringing with it early editions of the evening papers our pause was hardly appreciable perhaps we did not quite come to a standstill but one enterprising orderly managed to obtain a single copy of an evening paper through a window near the guard's van at that time i was at the far end of the train near its engine talking to some wounded men of a north country regiment in a matter of perhaps two minutes it actually was before the train had regained its full speed the news in that evening paper reached us there in the forepart of the train i am not quite sure how it came i started then on a walk through the train to its rear end it is a pleasant privilege to carry cheery news to these devoted lovers of good cheer the wounded but it was i who was given the news from every cot and with tumultuous enthusiasm among the sitting cases no more than two minutes had elapsed since we glided through winchester but rumania's come in oh yes it's official what about the balkan zug and the highway to baghdad now pretty good day for serbia this didn't some fellow say it would shorten the war by six months the blackboard writers in the trenches will be busy to-night news for fritz all right to-day this ought to show em the allies don't mean to stop at any half measures the bosch fighting machine has got to be smashed right up they ought to see it coming now well i'm glad said an elderly colonel with his right arm slung and the cool quiet satisfaction of his tone so suggestive of a man's unalterable determination was curiously impressive people have thought em slow but i suspect they had excellent reasons for biding their time you may be pretty sure they knew the best time it's a sort of underlining of the letters of fire on the wall yes i'm glad i fancy the boche will be able to read this i was unable to find a single man who had not had the news one heard quietly cheery murmurs of good first rate and the like even from the sort of cases one does not speak to because they lie so still or because perhaps a glance at labels or bandages has previously told one that their condition is serious it's true is it about rumania sir said one muffled voice and i recognized a corporal for whom with some difficulty i had arranged the smoking of a cigarette on the landing stage his bandages were a very complete disguise and i had learned what i think he had known for a day or two that he would never see again i was told this corporal had thrown a number of bombs after the explosion which had robbed him forever of his sight and wounded him in half a dozen places inscrutable incomparable courage of the spirit that no devilishly inspired bosch device can ever quell the very voice of this man was eloquent of modest but quite unquenchable good cheer being english we cannot embrace such men but to the end of our days we can pay them the homage of real respect we can see to it in strictly practical ways that we never become wholly unworthy of their splendid sacrifices yes corporal it's true and then some sudden stir in one made one add and coming on top of what you did there below thripville corporal it's pretty good isn't it what they did there below thripville he was only one of that heroic band all humble all modest all invincible merely invincible i have talked with a number of them the truly great the epic episodes of this vast war are so numerous so almost continuous that the world cannot hope to know very much about nine-tenths of them but known or unknown nothing truly great can ever really be wasted it can never be as if it had not been never the measure of these episodes cannot be taken the limit of their results cannot possibly be set 
each is one impulse in the rhythmic symphony of pressure which is presently to rid the modern world of the most deadly peril civilization has faced in our time or any other time if there are left in berlin sanely understanding students of the cataclysm a knell must be rung in their hearts by all such episodes as that in which this simple english corporal with no thought or desire in life but just very simply to do his duty smitten to his knees and blinded by the explosion of a german shell continued fighting with the weapon he had been taught to use till carried away because he happened to be one of those who had been detailed as the phrase goes to present a forthright english no to the ferociously desperate assertion of the might of the vaunted prussian guard no we didn't let em through sir they couldn't get through us that was as much as the corporal had to say about it and it is not easy to induce any of his heroic comrades to say much more that is their english way god bless em yet from one here and there from a gunner officer from an intelligence officer of a unit not in the show and for that matter from the terse and pregnant lines of sir douglas haig's own communiques we know that even this unparalleled war has yielded no more splendid instance of sheer endurance of stark unshakable bravery than that wild week gave us below Threpfell where german desperation saw its most concentrated efforts and the flower of its army broken wave after wave against the cool unalterable determination of the citizen soldiers of britain's contemptible little army the men were splendid End of chapter twenty End of Psalm Battle Stories by Alec John Dawson